When I was 11, I went to the Philippines with my mom to meet my family for a few weeks. The stay was pretty normal, nothing strange going on, except for one night. I remember it because it was blistering hot and I was constantly sweating on the bed. The place we were staying at was my grandmother's home, a small two-story house with about nine people living there, mainly my mom, sister, and her family. The room that my mom and I shared had no door and had a view to a balcony at the end of a hallway. On the night in question, I woke up for no reason. It was pretty late, around 3 a.m. My bed had a perfect view of the hallway all the way to the balcony, and standing there was a boy, or what I assume was a boy. At first, I thought it was my cousin, Jeebi, and so I asked him, Hey, why are you up? I got no response, rolled over, and went back to sleep. But this nagging feeling kept bugging me, and I realized that it got kind of cold. Though not freezing, it was noticeably cooler and more comfortable now compared to how hot it had been. So I roll back over and I notice the boy is still standing there, and that's when alarm bells begin going off. GB, go to bed, you're freaking me out, I yell. The sound of my voice wakes my mom up, and she looks at me asking why I was yelling in the middle of the night, saying that I was going to wake the whole neighborhood. At this point, I tell her to tell GB to go to bed because he's bothering me. She looks confused and said, GB is asleep, what do you mean? I said, look by the balcony, he's right there, don't you see him? I point down the hall at the boy, who this entire time just stood there watching us. My mom thinks I'm playing some kind of game, and goes, there's no one there, go to bed. At this point I'm freaking out, and I beg my mom to make sure my cousin is in bed. Seeing how distraught I am, she got up and went to look. She turns on the light to the hallway. Mind you, the boy is still there watching. She walks down the hallway through the boy and goes to check on her sister and her kids and confirms they were all there. She walks back to the room again, walking through him once more. At this point, I realized that the boy had no face, and I just kind of shut down. My mom then remarked on how it was a little chilly that night, and she hoped that I didn't get sick since the clothes I wore were wet with sweat. Then she just turned off the hallway lights laid back down and went to sleep. I just stared at the boy in horror, too young to realize what was going on. I felt like I was in some kind of weird staring contest. Eventually I blinked and it was gone. I tried telling everybody what I saw in the morning, but none of my aunts, uncles, or cousins even cared. Though my mom was kind of freaked out by it because she is a believer in the supernatural. It was my grandmother who supplied answers. You probably saw your grandfather, she tells me after she finishes listening to my story. He did something like that with your sister when she came a few years ago. He always likes to tease. He did when he was alive, and he does now. Don't be too bothered by it. Consider it good luck. Honestly, I still don't know how to feel about it. This happened just a few weeks ago. I work at an after-school daycare center for elementary-aged kids. We work out of a portable building outside the school. On this day, all of the kids were outside for recess. This doesn't happen often, as the older and younger kids have different schedules most days, so some kids and one teacher are almost always there. Well, we forgot to bring outside the medicine for one of our epileptic kids, which is a big no-no. And as I'm just an aide, my boss sent me back to the building to grab it and come back. No big deal. I walk into the building and start heading to the backpack when I see what I can only describe as a ball rolling across the floor. It came out of the hallway and moved toward my boss's desk. 
The thing was pitch black, with hints of purple, and it moved silently. The entire building was dead silent except for my breathing, but still, I couldn't hear this thing. At first I thought it was just a ball, but we don't have any balls inside. At that time, they were outside with all of the kids. Then I thought, maybe I had seen a mouse or something. But upon looking at the area where the thing had stopped moving, I didn't find anything. I'm religious, and I remember hearing that many spirits will leave if they hear a person say Jesus' name. So I started sort of chanting his name as I went and used the bathroom, then grabbed the bag. I wasn't exactly scared, but my heart was racing, and I was definitely uneasy. I grabbed what I needed and left in a hurry, and didn't think about it again until just the other day. I have no idea what I saw. I've never seen or even heard of anything like it before. I suppose it's possible that I was just seeing things, but I swear, this ball was so real, and then it just wasn't there. I grew up in a house on a rural back road, and looking back on it now in my adult life, I feel like there was a lot of dark energy in the house. There were a few events that happened to me and others while living in that house that I will never forget. This is one of the experiences that happened to my brother and I. For backstory, I lived in a very small rural city with a thousand people on an island in an area rich with dense forests, vast hay fields, and roads that go on and on to seemingly nowhere. Truthfully, I was a very strong-minded kid who, oddly enough, would adventure into the woods all day alone. Or we would play hide-and-seek outside at nighttime around our property. Some nights I would even go outside and just lay in my yard and watch the stars. None of that bothered me but I was scared of my house. My little brother, who shared this one particular experience with me, slept with his bedroom light on his entire childhood. I spent a lot of time sneaking into my parents' room during the night to feel safer. I never liked going into the basement by myself. I avoided the wood room in our basement as much as I could, and I also didn't like being home alone. This whole event happened over two minutes on a summer day. I was 15, and my brother was 11. My parents were at work, which was normal. And I remember my brother and I laying on our couch. We were home alone, watching TV in the living room, and sitting about six feet away from the landing of a flight of stairs, which goes to the second floor. In my house, once at the top of the L-shaped stairs, there's a door directly ahead of you, a door to the right, and an empty hallway to the left with four other doors and other rooms. There's nothing in the hallway, just light bulbs and switches. While watching TV, I heard a noise upstairs, a muffled thud. Just the wind. That's what you instinctively tell yourself, right? We continued to watch TV, and at this point, my brother hadn't even acknowledged or noticed the first noise, but I had, because it was so strange. Then, the same sounding noise came again. It wasn't one single sound, but a couple of sounds tied together that made it seem more intentional. The noise wasn't anything I could pinpoint, but it did sound like a brief second of furniture moving very slightly. That was enough to scare me, and my brother could tell at this point that I was very focused on the stairs and not the television. These noises were not extremely loud, but definitely not something created by wind. I was nervous, and I muted the television for a moment, so the house was basically silent. After one more thud from upstairs, I was petrified, and I started to sit up a bit. My brother was also beginning to become more alert and nervous. I remember him saying something to reassure me, and we both sat up. He began to say something else as I was trying to listen acutely and figure out what the hell was going on upstairs. I snapped, listen. 
At that second, a much, much louder and closer series of sharp, crashing sounds occurred. This time, it was so loud and sudden that when it happened instinctively, we both jumped up and started to run out of the living room through the kitchen as quickly as we could. We tried to run outside and get out of the house. I tried to open the door and it wouldn't budge, almost like it was locked. But it wasn't locked, because the knob still moved, it just wouldn't push open. I don't think that the door has ever acted like that before, or since. I started to run to the sunroom, where the French doors led outside, and my brother followed. While we both ran full tilt to the other doors, on the way I looked into the living room, and at the base of the stairs I saw an out-of-place faux glass drinking cup. I realized that it was the source of the last sharper crashing sound because it had hit the walls in the staircase before tumbling down the last stairs and landing in the living room. Trying to figure out how it had gotten from a bedroom or bathroom to the bottom of the stairs still scares me to this day. I have no explanation of what created the energy to cause the noises and for the glass to travel the distance it did. There was another strange moment in that event because when we got to the other doors, I'll never forget in the half second it took me to unlock that door, my eyes were locked on a housefly that was alive and buzzing inside the glass. It got smeared against the window pane of the door as if something had swatted it, right in front of me, but nothing was there, and even if somebody had been, nobody could have reached it because it was between the glass. It was so sinister and shocking to see the once living fly get smushed before my very eyes as if an invisible force had put pressure on it. When I opened the door, we continued to run barefoot the fifty or so feet as fast as we could to our neighbor's house, who's also my Aunt Michelle. We instinctively ran as quickly as we could and we felt much safer there. We didn't bother to explain it in detail until my aunt asked what happened and we just said something had scared us. I remember her laughing at us because she thought that we were overreacting. It was really hard to sleep in that house that night, and I bet my life my brother slept with the light on, and I did too. Maybe five years ago, we were talking about scary things amongst friends, and I asked him, do you remember the day we were so scared that we ran over to Michelle's house? He replied laughing with, nope, we were scared a lot back in the day. I left it at that. I'm staying at his condo right now, and he's sleeping beside me peacefully, with the lights out. I'm tempted to ask him again what he remembers from that day, or any of the things that he remembers happening in our home, but I don't want to bring it up. I want to keep those memories out of his head, and I think he does too, and I definitely don't want new memories in mine. A lot of times I wish I didn't remember some of the things because I don't like revisiting those memories myself. But that house, and that day in particular, was terrifying. So this happened around five to six years ago to my uncle. He works for a big company, which has offices all over the country, so he's been transferred a few times. This one time he was transferred to a big city, so he rented a big truck to move his furniture and other household items. They finished the packing by evening and decided to start the journey by 7pm in the night so that they could reach their destination by morning. My father was accompanying him, so they started their journey. By around 2 or 3 a.m., around 2 or 3 a.m., the truck driver slowed the truck a bit, so my uncle and my father asked what happened. He said that there was a lady standing ahead and that she might be asking for help, and that we should check and make sure everything was okay. My uncle said, no, don't stop. We don't have time for all this, just keep going. He insisted, but my uncle didn't let him stop. So when they reached their destination, he was a bit angry with my uncle and father. He said, why wouldn't you have let me help that woman? My uncle said, 
The thing is, there was no woman on the road. We didn't see any woman standing there. Only you could see her. But we didn't want to tell you this because otherwise you might have been scared. And that would have been bad since we were driving on the highway in the night. This is a 100% true story that I will keep with me until the day I die. A number of years ago, when I was still living at home with my dad and stepmom, we had a large, beautiful, purebred German Shepherd. I had had a rough childhood, and this dog was my best friend. He was the smartest and most loyal dog I had, and still have, ever met. He passed away a few years after this incident, and I still think of him, and miss him often. Anyway, our house had a long hallway off the living room. Down the hallway was a bedroom on the left, followed by a bathroom and my bedroom that was at the very end. I had lived there since I was two, and I was used to being alone. I usually preferred it, honestly. So I was very comfortable in my surroundings. This particular evening, my dad and stepmom had gone out, and I was sitting on my bed watching TV, with my dog laying next to me. The front and back door were closed and locked, as well as the windows as I live in the north, and at night, especially in the fall, winter, and spring months, it gets quite cold. My bedroom door was closed and latched. My TV and light were on and one lamp in the living room was on, but no other electronics were on in the house. My dog and I were just sitting there on my bed. Movement caught my eye. My dog lifted his head to look at my door just as I turned my head. The two of us watched the door handle turning, as if someone were on the other side, opening the door. As the handle turned and the door opened, my dog sat up to attention, looking very tense. The door very slowly creaked open all of the way. I was quite stunned as I knew that I was home alone, and although I just saw the door handle turn and the door open, I could see nothing there that could have opened my door. Suddenly, my dog jumped up and off my bed. He took off running down the hallway faster than I could even react. As I got up to go investigate, I could hear the rumble of his growl coming from the living room. It got louder and louder as I got farther down the hallway. When I looked into the living room, he was standing underneath the ceiling fan, directly in the middle of the room, looking straight up. Remember, the fan wasn't on. The only things on in the entire house were a single lamp in the living room and my bedroom light and television. The black hair along his entire back was raised. He stood frozen, snout pointed up growling fiercely. I stared at him for a second as I had never seen him behave like this. He was so fixated on whatever it was that I didn't think he realized I'd followed him down the hall. Quietly, I called out to him. I called his name and asked him what was wrong. As soon as the words left my mouth, he spun around and stepped to me. He began making a soft whimpering noise, mushing his head against me pushing me back down the hallway. As I moved backward, he pushed harder. I turned away from the living room, and we were both running back down the hall by the time we got to my bedroom door. I turned my body to face the door as we crossed into my bedroom, and my door slammed shut and locked behind us on its own. I watched from three feet away as the lock turned. I have heard and read that when a door is slammed hard enough, the mechanism inside may get jostled enough to lock itself, but what had slammed the door shut in the first place? My dog stood by the door, not making a sound. He stared at the door handle, not moving a muscle. I called my dad, trying not to sound panicked, as I knew they wouldn't believe my story, and tried to casually ask when he would be home. He told me that they were on their way, and about twenty minutes out. My dog stood there, not moving, keeping his body between me and the door until my parents came home that night. 
I don't know what it is that had the power to unlatch and open my door, slam it shut, and lock it. I don't know what it was that my dog saw that night, but I could feel that while he was pushing me away from the living room, he was trying to protect me. He knew it wasn't safe. He was pushing me away from whatever he saw or felt. He stood guard for me until my parents came home. He was my best friend and my protector. Rest in peace, buddy. Thank you for keeping me safe. My husband saw my doppelganger in our hallway last night. We live in an old farmhouse, and we have had many paranormal and unexplained spirits, noises, etc. We have had paranormal investigators to our house, and were waiting on the report. Last night, I was in the bathtub. My husband came into the bathroom to wash his hands, and went back out to do the laundry. He was in the laundry room and looked through the kitchen, and saw what he thought was me in the hallway, with no clothes on. He called my name and said that she turned her face toward him and gave a look like she didn't know who he was. Then she walked a step behind a column and our son came out from the same column but from the opposite way. Our son asked who my husband was talking to and said that he couldn't see me. My husband came into the bathroom where I was still in the tub, unaware of all of this. He made me swear left and right that I hadn't left the bathtub. He was very freaked out, and he made us follow him from room to room the rest of the night and announce ourselves if we came into a room where he was. He had spoken to a medium a few months ago. She's coming Saturday to bless us and our home. She said that she would try to see what spirits were there and try to release them. She also told me before to place black salt around our doorways and the four corners of our home. I really hope it works. A few years ago, I owned a recording studio in Rock Springs, Wyoming, in the basement of the old Woolworths building. My brother-in-law ran a snowboard shop up on the main floor, and the basement had a room that I used to record musicians. The whole basement couldn't be kept lit. I would buy light bulbs every week to replace the ones that had popped. One room would stay somewhat lit, so I set up shop in there. There were many experiences that were unexplainable, but one stands out above the rest. I had finished recording a band that evening, and they all packed up and left. I locked the door behind them and watched them drive away. Going back down to the studio in the basement, I went to start mixing the audio. About 20 minutes into the process, I stopped the music for a second to adjust some things and heard running down the stairs to the basement, then frantic running down the hallway toward my room. I had left the door open. I looked down the hallway to see what was going on. There was absolutely nothing there. I was quite freaked out, but I really needed to get the mixes done, so I went back to work and tried hard to concentrate on the music. About five minutes later, the exact same thing happened except this time I ran to the hallway to catch the cause of the noise. So there I am, staring down this darkened hallway, hearing something frantically running toward me, and there's nothing there that I can see. I checked the entire basement, which scared the crap out of me, because there was only one light still working in the rest of the basement. I found nothing and no one. I went and checked the door upstairs, locked. I went back to the studio and decided to put on some headphones to keep the creepiness out. Well, that didn't work at all because as I was mixing, I could feel a horribly angry presence behind me. In my mind, I could see exactly what the presence looked like. It was a very angry, bald Asian man, about 40-ish. I kept looking behind me, but nothing. 
Soon the man felt like he was standing right over me, his fists clenched and up over his head like he was going to hit me. I turned around and saw a door down the hallway, closed slightly, all on its own. That was it. I was out. I packed up my studio the next week and never went back. After studying a bit about the history of the area, I came to find out that there was what was dubbed the Chinese Massacre on that same street about a hundred years ago. It was where a bunch of Chinese railway workers were killed by local folks for, quote, taking their jobs. So crazy. I have several stories of Mexico. It's a place of many myths and legends. This one is one that a friend of mine recounted to me about his uncle and his uncle's friend stuck in a horrifying circumstance. So my buddy's uncle and his friend were headed home on a highway one night years ago in the state of Oaxaca. You see, they rode in one of those old flatbed trucks that are used to put whatever vegetables or fruits might have been picked that day. They were farmers. Most were, as Oaxaca was very rural at the time and had only just had a highway installed of actual concrete. As they were returning home, the uncle noticed something in the rear view mirror and made out what seemed to be a horse about 150 feet away. He couldn't really make out its features and didn't think anything of it till he drifted off to sleep in the passenger seat. As he slept, the uncle had a small nightmare of a horse with large black eyes running up to his passenger side. The dream startled him awake. He gathered his bearings when he looked over to his buddy that was driving. His buddy had a terrified look on his face and was driving about 50 miles an hour which, at the time, was pretty fast for a truck that size. He said, why are you driving so fast? And the friend responded by saying that they were being followed. He said that for the past couple of miles, that horse in the rear view was slowly inching its way closer and closer to the vehicle. That's when the panic began to settle in, and they both felt immense fear wash over them. They sped up to about 65 to try and get away, but the clanking of the hooves of this horse slowly kept getting louder and louder behind them. The one driving said not to turn around and look anymore, to just look ahead and not look at the horse, because it seemed to gain on them whenever they glanced back at it. The uncle closed his eyes in fear, only listening, and when the hooves inched closer and closer, he glanced to the side of the window and saw the large black eyes of the horse looking directly at his friend from the passenger side as it had now caught up. It was just like his dream. The uncle screamed for his friend not to look and to just look straight because the horse had a fixated gaze on him. They sped up all they could and still the horse kept a swift pace still staring at the driver. When he finally glanced, he began to cry, overwhelmed with emotion and panic, when the horse suddenly began to slow down. As it did, the uncle saw it in the rearview mirror once more, except this time it had no legs. It was just standing in the road, floating, staring at them with its huge black eyes. They told the grandfather of the man driving when they arrived home what they had witnessed. And he told them that the road that was built there had gone straight through sacred Nahuatl territory, and they had been lucky to drive past the area at this time of night and survive, because everyone had felt that the ground there was salado, or salted, meaning washed with bad energy. I was 24 or 25 at the time and worked for a private Catholic hospital in Auckland, New Zealand, which was over a hundred years old. 
My shift of preference was the night shift, from 11 o'clock at night to 7 in the morning, as I didn't have to deal with all the political crap that goes on in hospitals. This hospital was run by nuns of the Mercy Order that originated in Ireland. These nuns kept a close eye out on how the wards were run and operated, and it was not uncommon to see them in their habits, checking on how things were going any time of the day or night. They were extremely strict, but they did care about their patients. Originally, the hospital had been a free hospital, but at some stage had become private and catered to those who could afford to use their services, which actually in New Zealand is not too much of an issue, as we have a free public hospital system here, where I did my training and worked for most of my nursing career. Anyway, on the ward that I was working on at the time, I was sole charge that night, with a supervisor who would pop in when I needed her to check on medications for patients or the help if I needed it. So I rarely saw anybody during the night, apart from, as I mentioned before, my supervisor, or the odd nun who would pop in rarely to make sure everything was alright. This one night at about 3am, I was in the sluice room, emptying a bedpan one of the patients had just finished with. The sluice sink is only a few feet from the door, and as I stand there facing the sink, the door is to my left hand side. Obviously, due to the noise that is made in sluice rooms, I always made sure that the door to the sluice room was firmly shut before I started to do any work in there, so as to cause the least disturbance to patients trying to sleep. So I'm standing at the sink, rinsing the metal bedpan before putting it into the sterilizer, when out of the corner of my eye, I suddenly saw a tall nun standing in front of the sluice room door. She was tall, thin, wearing an old-fashioned habit, all black, barring the white bit around her face. She had her hands clasped in front of her, and I got a sense of slight disapproval from her. She looked to be in her forties, perhaps. All this from out of the corner of my eye. My thought was, perhaps I was being a little noisier than I thought, and she was about to let me have it. I admit I did jump because I didn't hear her enter, but I put it down to concentrating on what I was doing. A couple of seconds after I became aware of her, I finished what I was doing and turned to face her. To my utter shock, there was nobody standing there. The door was still firmly closed, and there's no way she could have left the room without the door being opened. I admit I stood there for a couple of minutes so my heart rate could slow down, and so my breathing could return to normal. I put it down to one of the old nuns who had passed, just checking up on the staff to make sure they were doing their job properly. I couldn't actually ask any staff if they had seen anybody before in that area of the hospital, as it really wasn't the sort of place where talking about ghosts was really accepted. I was young and didn't have the self-confidence that I have these days but it was still an interesting experience. This is two separate experiences that come together in one big event. One day, I was home with my mom, just hanging out in the living room and watching TV. My mom got a phone call and I watched her go upstairs. Like, I literally watched her go up the stairs. A couple of minutes later, I went upstairs to ask her a question. She wasn't up there. I looked all around the house and eventually I found her sitting on the porch, still on the phone. I asked her if she went upstairs and she looked at me like I was crazy. She said she hadn't been upstairs all day. A couple of weeks later, I'm sitting on my bed, using my laptop. My mom was getting ready for bed. I looked up and saw my mom standing in my doorway in a white nightgown. She sleeps in one just like it, so I didn't think twice about it. Her hair was kind of messed up. She didn't say anything, she just looked at me. And I looked back down at my laptop. When I looked up again, she was gone. I thought she went to her room. I heard something in the bathroom, so I went to check it out, and she was right there in front of the mirror, taking off her makeup, with her hair still fixed from earlier that day, and in her normal day clothes, 
no nightgown. I asked her how she had changed so fast. She looked at me again like I was crazy. About a month later, my parents got into a really severe car accident where the truck they were in flipped three and a half times and my mom's side almost got T-boned by a semi-truck. According to some people, what I saw was my mom's doppelganger. And when someone sees a doppelganger, it means that something bad is going to happen to that person. I don't know if it was a warning or what, but it was certainly weird. My friend tragically died in 2016, only 20 years old at the time. Before his passing, he had messaged me, telling me that he would choose me over anything. He tragically passed away on the early hours of Saturday, and never got to reply to his message due to having a very overprotective ex. The day of his viewing was hard, only because I tragically had this regret in my gut because I was never able to message my friend. I had this huge urge to touch his cheek, but I didn't due to respect for his family members. So when I went home after his viewing, I cried and drifted off to sleep. My dream started like normal. It was like I was just trying to figure a situation out. I was taken to this long hall that reminded me of the movie theaters. I saw my friend, and he ran up to me and said, Oh my gosh, I miss you, and I love you, and gave me this huge hug that was so unexpected, and then ran off. I will never forget the dream, how he was there, and how he made me feel like everything was okay. So the day of his funeral, I didn't go, because I was really depressed, and I just wasn't ready to say goodbye. I still visit his grave, since he was buried a few feet apart from my grandma. I've had a couple of strange dreams about him. One, where his lifeless body was in a bathtub with boiling hot water, and I kept touching his cheek. I know it sounds weird, but I can't help my dreams are that way. Also another dream happened where I was walking down the stairs, and I saw his closed casket in my living room. It was just really strange, but maybe he wanted to tell me everything was fine that it was okay I didn't reply and that he was at peace. I haven't seen him in my dreams recently, but I do hope he appears soon. I miss his voice, and just his laughter brings me more peace when I'm sleeping. Sometimes I sleep next to his pictures. I know he's at peace, and I hope he surprises me again in my dreams. I would do anything to hear his voice one more time. I've been with my boyfriend for going on three years, and have known that he is schizophrenic for the past two. He kept information about it to himself up until we moved in together, and a new hallucination gives me the creeps. I'll catch him staring off into the darkness, or dimly lit areas for seemingly no reason, with a terrified look on his face. He finally explained to me last night that he's been seeing a new figure, and he's scared. He's been seeing the same things for most of his life, so he's grown to cope with them. But not this one. This new creature is a dark, six to seven foot tall figure that likes to lurk around the corners in our apartment and stare at him. He describes it as an almost bird or humanoid hybrid with red glowing eyes that just stares and nothing else. This would be normally terrifying just by itself, but it's even more terrifying since I've been seeing the same thing. Normally, I of course write off most of his hallucinations as part of his schizophrenia, and he does as well. But I'm not schizophrenic, and we're seeing the same exact thing. Sometimes I'll see it at the same time he does, but usually I see it when I'm home alone. 
It will be peeking at me by our closet door, only its red eyes visible in the dark. I'll catch a glimpse after I shut my hallway light off. My cats will stay away from the areas that I see it in. I don't believe in the paranormal, and I'm pretty sure I'm not schizophrenic. I don't know what's happening, and I have no idea what to do. Honestly, I'm just scared. This happened after I turned 12 years old. At the time, my father was battling cancer for the second time. I was 10 when he managed to beat it the first time. However, it came back. Despite hoping he could beat it again, things weren't looking so good for him. During his last days in the hospital, I would visit him, despite being out of it. Being a kid, it was rather distressing, seeing him so pale and skinny and barely recognizing me now and then. It was especially bad when I visited him the day before he passed. My mom didn't want to upset me even further, so she sent me to my grandmother's house while she stayed overnight with my father. Since I was old enough to be home for a while, I was sent back to my house, alone. I spent the majority of the day alone, getting a few calls from my mother making sure I was alright. However, while I was sitting in my room playing video games, I got a very off feeling that something had happened. Only minutes after, I received a phone call from my mother telling me that she would be home shortly. Thinking back on the call, I know she was trying not to sound upset, but I didn't pick up on that. I still had this off feeling, and I knew deep down in my soul what had happened. When my mother walked through the door, she told me my father had passed and broke down crying right there. I gave my mother a hug, and as we were facing the door that she had just come through, we saw it. We saw a tall, shadowy figure materialize and walk forward into our home. I would assume this was my imagination, but the fact that my mother saw the same thing at the same time proved that it wasn't. We realized my father had probably come home immediately after passing, not wanting to leave us quite yet. Ever since then, I've been a strong believer of the paranormal. It's around 4.30 a.m. here, and all the dogs in my neighborhood started freaking out at once. I got up to let my dog inside the house, figuring that maybe things would calm down a bit. I opened the back porch door and looked to my right, where there's a fence line to another house. I looked over there because it looked like there were clothes hanging off the fence, and our neighbors have never done that, so I thought it was weird. Then I saw them. Two men in black suits, with no heads. I looked at them for a good minute to make sure my eyes weren't playing tricks on me. They didn't move, they just stood there. I could tell that one looked heavier than the other, but that's it. I backed into the house, locked the back door, and turned off the light. I go back to my room and my husband is now awake because of all the dogs barking. I tell him I'm going to wait until it's light out to get the dogs, because I just saw something I can't explain. I told him what I saw, and I said, I feel like I sound crazy, but I know what I saw, and I'm not joking. He seemed like he believed me, but I don't know. I have no idea what these creatures or things could have been. When I moved out of my house, I moved into an old, creepy house. The heating didn't work, the windows wouldn't close properly, and the cupboards were full of these elaborate handmade shelves. There were doors that led to rooms that led to other rooms that didn't make any sense. 
the house just didn't seem to have a normal layout. But the creepiest room was the laundry room. It was a large square room with white tiles with a drain in the middle. Just think of a location inspired by the Saw movies. When you walked into this room, it had three steps down to the floor. On the right was a sink and two doors, one for a shower and the other for a toilet. Straight ahead was the door to the garage, and next to it, on the left, the cupboard under the stairs. The cupboard was freezing cold, but it was completely cement and brick, no draft and no gaps, just pitch black darkness. I lived with three other people, but our schedules were all mixed, so Tuesdays were my nights alone. I started to notice things like glass breaking in the kitchen, but I'd walk in and nothing was broken. I'd walk outside to get the mail and close the door behind me with my dog inside and come back to see her on the front step. Then the nightmares started. Night after night I'd have terrifying nightmares of someone knocking on my door and getting up to answer it and no one being there. I brushed all of this off as just the product of an idle mind. Then one night, I was home and watching TV, and suddenly I heard a loud rattling. I jumped to my feet and walked to the laundry door, where I could hear the rattling on the other side. Probably somebody trying to get in through the locked garage, I thought. I opened the door, and the garage door handle was still, but the cupboard one wasn't. The entire door was shaking violently, like someone was inside the cupboard, trying to get out. I froze, but just for a minute, grabbed my dog and left the house until someone agreed to come over with me. I had a friend come over and we both walked inside. I sat on a stool well over a meter away from the wall. My friend sat at the table. Maybe you have ghosts, she said. I just want to add that I was raised religious and told that there was no such thing as ghosts for 18 years of my life. In my head, there had to be a logical explanation, and my fears were surely irrational. There's no such thing as ghosts, I scoffed. Without another second, I felt pressure on my shoulder, which pushed me off the stool and slammed me onto the wall in one quick motion. To clarify, I didn't fall off the stool. If I did, I would have hit my head on the wall. Instead, my entire body was slammed into the wall. I stood and looked at my friend, and she looked at me. We said nothing to each other. I grabbed my keys and my dog, and we went to get dinner. Nothing was ever spoken about it. I moved out shortly after, but I will never say that ghosts don't exist again. I just want to share a story that happened to my mom when her mother passed away. This story has always given me hope that there is, in fact, an afterlife. My grandfather passed away when I was four. I literally only have one memory of him since I was so young. He came to me in a dream when I was five, and it's one of the most vivid dreams I've ever had, like it was real and he was really there. My mom used to say that she could feel his presence all the time. Six years later, when I was ten, my grandmother was very sick. We lived in Detroit, and my grandmother in New Orleans. My aunt also lived in New Orleans. During the few months she was in and out of the hospital, my mom flew down there to spend time with her mom twice. The second time she flew down there, my grandma was getting worse and was bedridden in the hospital. My mom and aunt spent most of their time in the hospital room, and it didn't look good. My mom had to come back home to take care of my sister and I, and I felt guilty that she might not be there when her mom passed away. She came home, and a couple of days later was sitting in our dining room, when she says both of her parents appeared. Not physically appeared, but their presences. My grandma and grandpa were communicating with her telepathically. My grandma said to her, I finally get to see your new house. 
can't believe I had to die to finally do it. My parents had just recently bought their first home. My mom started crying, realizing that her mom was now dead, and my grandpa said, Don't be sad. We're very happy now and in a great place. My grandma then said, Don't feel bad that you weren't with me in the hospital, because I'm with you now. My mom stood up and walked to our sunroom and sat down, and she says her parents followed her there. My mom said that her dad said something like, We're both in heaven, and this place is the most wonderful place you could imagine. This feeling that I'm about to share with you is a tiny fraction of what it's like here. Immediately following him saying this, my mom said she felt the most intense peace she's ever felt in her life. She couldn't even put it into words. After that, my grandma said, We have to go now, but we'll always be with you. My mom then stood up and walked back into the house. When she walked through the kitchen and passed the phone, it started ringing. This was before caller ID, but she knew who it was. She answered the phone, and it was my aunt, delivering the news of their mom's passing. My mom just said, I know, she and dad just came to see me. My mom and her parents have always had a gift of psychic abilities and an openness to seeing things on the other side. She has no reason to make this up, and I believe her. The two dreams I remember the most in my life is one with my grandpa when I was about five, and one with my grandma shortly after she passed when I was ten. They were the most vivid dreams I've ever had, and I believe they actually came to see me in those dreams. I was driving alone to my parents' house, about a two-hour drive from where I live. It was 2 a.m., and I had already had a long day, so I started to feel very sleepy, and pretty soon, I started to doze off and lean forward in my seat. Then I felt something squeeze my right shoulder and pull me back in the seat. I felt this squeeze on my shoulder for a couple of minutes, and I just looked straight ahead. I didn't dare look in the rearview mirror because I felt a presence in the back seat. I got this tingling feeling throughout my entire body, almost like I'd had too much caffeine. The squeeze eased up, and I didn't feel tired at all after that. I made it to my parents safely. I have no way of explaining this. I don't know if it was a guardian angel or a passing ghost. I don't really know what it was, but whatever squeezed my shoulder definitely saved my life. I work at a bar restaurant in downtown Denver on a very old block. Everyone has had ghost experiences, ranging from, oh well, that could have just fallen off by itself, I guess, to experiences that made people grab their stuff and run out during clothes. I luckily haven't had the second yet, but today was finally something that happened to me, and it was kind of creepy. My experience with Josephine, as we've named her, has mostly been trash being taken out when I get a new liner ready and the bag full of trash is nowhere to be found when I'm alone or the occasional footsteps going up and down the stairs when I'm by myself. Today I was opening alone and nobody else would be in for another hour or so when this happened. I came in and locked the door, went into the kitchen to get some fruit, and heard someone in the dining area say, Hello? Like they needed something. I peeked into the dining room, but nobody was there. I'm thinking, hmm, huh, I locked the door behind me. Maybe it's just someone on an ad on Spotify. But then I realized I hadn't turned on Spotify yet. I kind of brushed it off and went into the office to set up my drawer as I was walking to the bar area. I heard it again, but this time it was right behind me. It said, um, hello? this time sounding just as alarmed as I was. I turned on the music really loud, hoping not to hear it again before the other people came in. So 
So this happened a few months back, when I happened to be in the bathroom. I was singing that Willow Smith song. You know, that wait a minute song, minding my own business. I got to the point in the song where she quotes a phrase said in the Avatar movie in their language. And while I'm singing it, I'm thinking to myself at the same time, hmm, I wonder what that actually means, translated into English. As I finish singing the line and simultaneously trying to recall what it translated to, a female disembodied voice said, no you can't. I shut up immediately and paused a second, shocked. It sounded as if somebody was speaking into a tin can, but very clearly, and only a few feet away. I left the bathroom completely weirded out, and after a few minutes, I remembered about wanting to know what that phrase meant. I googled it and found out that it meant, I see you, in English. I was, and am, still blown away by this strange experience. This just happened to me, and I've been up for the past hour, panicked. I woke up at 3.15, on the dot, and checked my phone. I stretched, yawned, and laid there for about 10 minutes, not feeling a hint of being scared. So right now, I'm sleeping on the pullout in the living room with my girlfriend. My sister is in her room, and there's an empty bedroom with bathrooms attached. So I'm facing the whole apartment, if that makes sense. Where I'm laying, I can see the dining room, half of the kitchen, and the very small hallway where the three doors are to the rooms. Mind you, I'm wide awake, scrolling on my phone, and I roll over to face the wall and the window. I'm not laying there more than five minutes when I hear creaking, like a door, even though, like I just said, everyone's asleep. I brush it off, thinking it was the heat. That's when I hear, clear as day, right in the room, a girl's voice say, Hello? I whip around on the bed, but I see absolutely nothing. I listened really hard, which is easy to do in a dead silent apartment, and all I hear is my sister snoring. I know the voice wasn't my sister's, as it sounded nothing like her. But trying to calm myself down, I just tell myself that my sister's talking in her sleep. So I lay back down, and this time I face the apartment again, with my back to the wall. I rest my head on my pillow, and again begin to scroll on my phone. That's when I hear what I would call a goblin-like voice. That's all I can imagine. Something grumbled and high-pitched. And it wasn't like a significant word or phrase, but just a jumble of words and syllables. I instantly felt sick. It was a feeling of anxiety and dread and fear all at once. I've had paranormal experiences before where I believe I've seen a ghost in the apartment, but I would have to say that this was the most terrifying thing to ever happen to me. It was just about an hour ago, and I know exactly what I heard. It almost sounded like a laugh, if that makes sense. I don't want to sound like I'm making this up because I'm not, but it almost sounded like a different language, like it had an internal consistency. I'm planning on going and getting sage today to go around the house and say some prayers and whatever I can do. I did check on my sister twice just to make sure nothing was in there and she was okay. She was sound asleep the whole time. I woke my girlfriend up and we walked around the apartment just to be safe. I'm absolutely sure of what I heard. And I think that's what terrifies me the most. If someone has any idea of an explanation, I'd love to hear it to ease my mind.
In 2001, my youngest son was hit by a car. He was only four years old. It was very bad. He stopped breathing, his heart stopped, and he was revived three times. The neurologist told my wife and I that the injuries were severe and that most likely he would not survive the night. We were devastated. He was in a coma, naturally, and also they added meds to make sure he stayed that way, just to keep his brain pressure down. He did survive the night, though, and about a week later he woke up. After they took out the breathing tube, he could talk. He kept asking where Veronica was. I asked the nurses if one of them, or one of their co-workers, was named Veronica. They said that nobody worked there with that name. I asked him what Veronica looked like. He said she was an old woman who talked funny. I asked if she was dressed like the nurses, and he replied no. She always wore the same clothes, a blue dress with yellow flowers. I asked what she said to him. He told me that she would come stand by his bed, hold his hand, and tell him she loved him and that everything would be okay. A few hours later, my in-laws showed up. I told my father-in-law about what my son was saying, and he turned white. He said he knew exactly who Veronica was. It was his mother, Veronica. She was from Slovakia and had a heavy accent, and she was buried in a blue dress with yellow flowers. Our son is named Joseph Michael. We found out after he was born from my father-in-law's older sister that they had had an older brother named Joseph Michael, who died in Slovakia at around four years old. My father-in-law was the only one born in the U.S. If I would not have experienced it, I wouldn't have believed it. But my son's great-grandmother reached out from across the grave to comfort her son's namesake. I also believe that she helped to make sure we would not relive the tragedy she went through. Pure love is the most powerful force in the universe. It can break time and space boundaries. If you're wondering, Joseph is doing just fine. He has issues from the brain injury, but he's a very intelligent 21-year-old now. He lives with us. Ever since he came home from the hospital all those years ago, we've had many experiences with things paranormal happening to us as well. Sometimes I wonder if since he died and was revived, he's closer to that side and attracts spirits. Either way, it was a beautiful experience, Veronica and were ever so grateful that she showed up. A little bit about me and the tribe I grew up in. I know I'm not supposed to share personal information on the internet, so I'll keep this as vague as I can though some specificity is required to describe the context in which the stickmen are nested. I was born into the Tagatele tribe in central Alaska in the 1980s. This is about 50 miles south of Fairbanks, in a small town called Nanana. Hey, Balto fans. There are several other tribes in the immediate area, and long ago there were far more, before Russian and American settlement. I don't want to identify myself on accident, in case anyone from there ends up reading this, but suffice to say that paranormal experiences are a natural and expected part of my ancestral heritage. As a child, my grandparents and my father told me strange tales of the stickmen, who were eaters of men. They especially loved the flesh of children, and newborn babies were considered delicacies by these spirits of the forest. One time, when Nanana was first being settled by Gusuk or white people, there was a hunter who came from faraway lands to settle the wilderness of Alaska and to hunt its bears and moose. He took a small party of hunters and native guides into the forest, deep into the countryside to the marshes, where the moose and bear frequented far down the Tanana they went, shooting every animal they saw, squirrel, moose, wolf, even porcupine. The natives were silent and led the men on, 
afraid to question their violent and wasteful ways. Until late one evening, the hunter called his party to set up camp and rest. They chose a quiet spot in a field where they could see all around them in case wolves decided to try to sneak up. And they rolled out of their blankets after dinner and went to sleep, leaving some to take turns watching for animals. The hunter had fallen asleep quickly, content on his bed of furs and blankets. He had dreams of sunny days, perfect for hunting, the famed grizzly. He was awoken by the sound of cracking sticks. He found this odd, as they were in a field, but perhaps it was men rekindling a fire. Still, he peeked out of his tent flap to check on the encampment. Horror of horrors. There were pools of blood on the ground, but no corpses. He watched as a man bundled tightly in his blankets was lifted up by what appeared to be many small moving sticks and was carried off toward the edge of camp. The man woke up from the gentle rocking hoofs convoy and screamed, alerting the remaining hunters in the camp who jumped up and reached for their guns. They were quick to draw, but were confused by what to fire at as mostly they just saw sticks on the ground moving in ways that were impossible. They decided to run because there was nothing clear to shoot at, but as they ran together they were chased by giant animals that appeared suddenly from the tall grass. The hunter waited until the men were being chased by all the animals and then jumped from his own tent and, without looking back when he heard their screams, ran as fast as he could. A week later, he showed up in Nenana, crazed, exhausted, and on the edge of death. He related his story, and then perished, for he would constantly wake up screaming if he tried to sleep, and thus he could not rest. A version of this story is common in my family, though some details change with the storyteller. My father has seen the stick men on a hunting trip, and like this apocryphal hunter, he has been crazed and terrorized by the memory ever since. It is said that though the stickmen go by different names and come to people in different shapes, that there is some regularity to their appearances. They generally come as either sticks, which blend in with trees or the ground until you come upon them, or they can visit as an animal. This animal is usually described as either a large deer or a small moose, which can move incredibly quickly for how awkwardly it seems to be hunched on its legs. They appear as pale or white animals, and though they usually do this to intimidate men and women, they are hungry beings who feast on the unwary. Seeing a stick man, one may be haunted for years or their entire life afterwards, but in some cases it is considered good luck. As if a stick man is uninterested in you, it means you have powerful ancestors surrounding you. You can usually anticipate the arrival of a stick man as the entire forest will go quiet around you for as long as they are in the vicinity, and sometimes they will speak to you and to each other. When this happens, they sound like a raspy whisper mixed with the rattling of dry willow branches, a light chattering. Do not camp where the forest is silent, and do not look into the eyes of the stickmen, for they will drive you mad with fear. I have never seen these spirits personally. My only experience with one, potentially, happened outside of Carson City, Nevada. I was driving alone in a big Ford pickup, late at night, when I noticed what originally I took to be a deer on the side of the road. But this was no deer. It ran like a dog or a cat, staying close to the ground in a liquid motion, whereas deer will bounce or gallop as they go. Also, it moved upwards of 30 miles per hour, and when it turned and ran down the hill, I realized it was much larger than almost any deer I've ever seen, yet lacked antlers. I don't know what I experienced that night, but whatever it was, I hope I never see the stickmen. This was roughly seven years ago. I worked the night shift on a psychiatric ward in the north of Sweden. I didn't believe in ghosts, 
but some strange shenanigans were quite often heard in the floor above my ward at the doctor's offices. It sounded like somebody was moving furniture a few minutes every now and then. We had nicknamed those sounds the ghost. One very calm night on the ward, the sound went on for much longer than we expected. So, me and two other colleagues decided to search for the source of the sound. When we went upstairs, we could easily pinpoint the dragging and slamming noises to one particular office of a certain psychiatrist. As soon as we opened the door, it went completely quiet. We stood there for a while, baffled. One of my colleagues let out a, hello? And as a response, two of his desk drawers opened violently and quickly. We ran the fuck out of there. This sound happened on almost a nightly basis, and not the only strange thing I experienced, but it was definitely the most frightening and the hardest to rationalize of all of it. When I was a six to seven year old, I woke up one night. I'm not sure of the time. I just know that Leno was on. I saw what I thought was my brother standing on our dresser, reaching for my Batman 1989 piggy bank that came with the cereal. I was really proud of it because it had 12 whole dollars in it that I had been saving to buy a Ninja Turtle. I don't know what made me think it was my brother. We both have very dark brown hair, almost black, but whoever was on the dresser was blonde and was wearing pajamas neither of us owned. Oh, and was internally glowing. He was lit up in a dark room, but somehow didn't cast any light. The room was totally dark. Anyway, I see this thing reaching for my bank and I think it's my brother trying to steal my money. I say, Joe, go to sleep. I wait a couple of seconds, still there. So I say it again and then again. On the third time, he turns and looks at me, still standing on the dresser. So I get even louder. Joe, go to sleep. And finally, when I'd really had it, Joey, come on, go to sleep. As I remove my blanket and turn on the lamp, it disappeared. I felt the blood leave my face and I let out a death scream. I ran downstairs to find my dad and brother watching Leno. I cried myself to sleep in my dad's arms, screaming about the ghost. That was the first and not the last time I've ever seen this stuff. This is a true story from an event that happened when I was just a little boy. I'm a 23-year-old man who, as of late, came to remember a terrifying experience I had as a 7-year-old kid. Back when I was in second grade, my mother and two siblings lived next door to my great-grandparents in a cottage that she rented from them. The rent was cheap, and since it was beachfront property, mom got a real bargain. I lived in the main house given the limited amount of room in the cottage. It was spring break and mom and I were the only people around the property. My brother and sister were visiting my aunt and younger cousins. I was offered a choice to go too, but I opted out because there was a Godzilla movie marathon all week. And being a huge fan of the monster, I couldn't pass it up. Two nights later, mom had finished cleaning up the table and I helped with the dishes. Shortly after that, curled up on the living room couch, to watch Godzilla vs. Biolanti. I must have fallen asleep during that movie because everything in the house was off and mom was already in bed. At least that's what I could gather. In the lower story of the house, the kitchen tile and the living room carpet were separated by a rubber border that was used to seal the tile and cover the carpet tack strip. The only two animals we had in the house were an Australian shepherd who was called Tucker which easily weighed 60 pounds, and Smokey, a puffy black calico cat, 
who never came downstairs. Now old Tucker had long toenails that would click on the wood-topped stairs. He'd also make quite a ruckus if he came down the steps, because he was a decent-sized dog. I heard a sick slapping sound, like your palms would make if you drum on the tile flooring in the kitchen. Now, if Mom was in the kitchen, making herself a snack, she'd need to turn on a light to see. No lights. No Mom standing in the kitchen. Nobody at all. I covered my head with my blanket and stayed perfectly still. Another smacking sound of flesh on tile. This one was closer than before. I listened and counted four distinct slaps. Whatever it had been was on all fours. It kept going until the smacking was replaced by the soft padding of feet on carpet. I heard breathing inches away from my face before the source of the sound moved away and up the steps. I stayed awake under the covers until dawn. Mom came downstairs and seemed surprised by my disheveled appearance. She claimed that I came upstairs in the middle of the night, trying to wake her up by snarling like Godzilla. The thing is, I never moved from the couch that night. Even as I type this, it gives me chills. So first, a little context. My house was built in 1599 for a wealthy farming family. The house has had extensions from the Victorian era and most recently the 70s, but much of the original home remains. It was a couple of days ago, but I was in my living room, half watching the news and half on my phone. My dog, who is a very old and chilled greyhound, suddenly jerks up from the sofa and looks directly to our window doors, looking down at the garden. At the time, the curtains were closed, so I thought maybe he had heard a fox or been disturbed by a pesky fly or something. And because I know that dogs can sometimes sense ghosts, I joked, asking if Granddad had popped in to say hello. He was still staring, and then suddenly something tapped the back door quite loudly. Thinking it could be a fox, maybe, after the chickens, I stood up and opened the curtains and looked out. It was dark, but no fox. Then I heard it. It was almost like breathing. At first, I thought it was the dog, but as I looked at him, he was facing the other way now. Yet I heard breathing, quiet but inside the room. I thought I had overreacted, and it was my own breathing. So I sat down. Yet it persisted, and it got slightly louder. And then I felt dizzy. It was like it was getting more intense, yet not louder. It felt like that dizziness that you get when you stand up too fast after you've been sitting for a while. But that made no sense, as I had been on my feet and fine just moments ago. I don't know how to put it, but it got worse, and I could feel myself panicking despite my efforts to stay calm, which surprisingly did not work. And soon it was too much. I went out of the room and upstairs into my own room, and stayed there the rest of the night. What made it worse is that when I sat there trying to comprehend what had just happened, I heard footsteps right below me. This is a personal ghost story that happened to me as a kid. It's the story I always tell when I'm asked for a ghost story. My grandfather on my dad's side died before me or my younger cousin were born. We never knew him, and we never really heard much about him, but we were still very curious. We would talk about him a lot, just the two of us, and try to imagine what he'd be like if he was still with us. At some point as a child, I developed this weird obsession of, like, talking to my grandpa. I did this in all sorts of ways, and the only other person who knew about this was my younger cousin. 
We would have sleepovers a lot, and this would often be a late night discussion. On one particular sleepover, it was not a late night, but we were talking about my grandpa. In fact, it was the middle of a summer day. We were talking about him, and I suggested that maybe both of us should start talking to him like how I did when I was alone. She was super into the idea. We were in her bedroom with the door closed tight. There were no windows open. There were no other people around us. Just us. In a completely still house. We began talking to him, and we asked a few times for him to give us a sign if he could hear us. We were just about to give up when we decided to ask one more time. I said, Grandpa, can you hear us? Give us a sign. And at that point, the doorknob to my room turned and the door opened. When I was 20, oh so long ago, I had a very tiny apartment. It was one half of a duplex built in the 50s. My landlord was a distant cousin, so he knew the history of the property. One afternoon, after cleaning and doing laundry, I decided to relax with my favorite book and a cup of coffee. I was sitting on my daybed, the place was too small for a couch and a bed, reading while my coffee was brewing. The book was a hardback special edition that I had read so many times the spine was broken. That meant I could lay the book down, still open, and it wouldn't close. I hear the last gurgles of my coffee pot, so I put my book on the daybed, still open, get up and go get myself a cup of coffee. I turn around to go back to my bed, and I see her. She was in her 20s, wearing a long brown skirt and green top. The style of clothes and hair was late 30s, early 40s. She was sitting on my daybed with her legs tucked up under her in stocking feet, just a relaxed pose, and she was leaning over reading my book. She looked up, saw me, gave me an impish, oops, you saw me, grin, and disappeared. I just stood there staring at where she'd been sitting. I stood there so long that when I finally came back to myself, my cup of coffee was cold. I immediately called my mom and told her what happened. She was solid. I couldn't see through her. I first thought she must be connected to the property somehow, but the duplex and the surrounding area hadn't been built until the 50s, and her dress and hair were from an earlier time. I never saw her again, and I've had no other encounters of that type but I remember everything about it to this day. I wasn't scared. Nothing about the encounter scared me at all or made me feel uncomfortable. In fact, I lived there for a couple more years, and every night before going to bed, I would take that book and open it to a new page and put it on my kitchen table, just in case she wanted to keep reading. First off, let me say, whether you believe this or not is of no concern to me, because I know no amount of convincing would ever have swayed me that this was something real until it happened. These are things you have to experience for yourself to be convinced sometimes. I don't have anything particularly dramatic to share. It's just a story that I need to share regardless. Shortly after my grandfather died, my siblings and I and cousins were at his house, sorting things out. You know, going through the motions of losing a loved one. Out of nowhere, we all heard our grandfather say, Hello, kids. We're from the north of England. We all looked at each other like, what the fuck? It was the most bizarre thing. It sounded like it had come from outside, or like when you have earphones in with the volume set really low. I've always been the I want to believe type of skeptic, but this made me an instant believer. If it had just been me that had heard it, I would have thought that I had finally lost the plot, but all of us heard it. It turned my entire grasp of life and all of its mystery upside down. 
It was the first time in my life that I'd had to sit down due to the shock of learning something. I won't pretend to know just exactly what happens when we die, but I've never been more sure of anything than I am that death is not the end. The thought of us being immortal souls terrifies me to no end, but also fascinates me to no end. It's not the most interesting story, as I warned you, but I've kept this to myself for long enough, and I hope that it's of some comfort or interest to someone. I'm an air conditioning and electrical contractor who works with several realtors in my area doing repairs on homes in escrow. I've been in more than one creepy vacant house. This was in late fall of last year. By 4.30 p.m. it was already dark. The house was empty, but the lights were on and we proceeded to replace the furnace. My helper got a strange feeling, kind of odd, heavy, and I agreed that I was also feeling weird. This house is about 30 years old in a typical subdivision in the North Valleys of Reno, Nevada. I made the comment that a couple of times that afternoon, I thought I had heard footsteps down the hall. He said that he had heard some too, but didn't say anything. We continued to finish up when he pointed down the hallway. There was a figure of a man, but only from the waist up, transparent, entering the front bedroom. We both saw it, and he called out, Hey! Hey, you're not supposed to be here. We checked out the room, but it was completely empty. The window was locked. We looked throughout the house, but we were the only ones there. We picked up our hand tools fast and called it a day. I couldn't lock that house up fast enough and get out of there. The next day, I was talking to the real estate agent, letting him know we had finished up and that the permit inspection was set for the next week. I asked him if he had any history on the house. He explained that the former owner's daughter was selling the place. It seems her mother had died that spring of last year in the house, and a couple of months later her father had shot himself in the bedroom. He then asked me, why? And I said, I'm just curious. He then tells me his client had told him that she had seen her father in the house while she was cleaning it out, and he thought she was just a little nutty. I kind of chuckled uneasily, and I never told him what we saw. I've told this event to maybe three people in my entire life in an effort to find some understanding to it, but I just came away feeling more misunderstood. When I was 11, I lived in New Jersey with my parents and two brothers. I never really had anything out of the ordinary happen in the house, until my dad started getting sick. I was being shielded about how sick he was because I was so young but I know now that he had terminal cancer. This was about October of 86. About this time, I started hearing the footsteps almost every night on the first floor of the house. The bedrooms were all on the second. The dining room and living room were connected by a distinctively creaky wood floor. You knew when it was being walked on. When I first started hearing it at night, I thought it was one of my older brothers sneaking in from being out with friends. But the footsteps never stopped. They circled between those two rooms, walking on that creaking floor until daylight. This went on for months, every night, while my dad steadily grew more ill. I had stopped sleeping. I might doze for the last hour of the morning because I physically couldn't stay up anymore. But here I was, eleven years old and I was getting pissed. And one night, I decided to confront this thing. My dad had been moved to the first floor of the house for hospice care. This was about April of 87. My mom had finally come to me, even though I knew it in my soul, and told me that he was going to die. One of the last nights, I waited for the steps. Like clockwork, they arrived. 
It took me a few hours of crawling from my bedroom and down the stairs to get where I needed to be. When I made it to the bottom step, my dad's room was to my right, and the living room and dining room doorway was directly in front of me. I heard the footsteps walk up to the doorway and stop. I saw nothing but darkness. I felt an intense, overwhelming surge of just pure emotion, all the good and all the bad that you can think of mixed together and intertwined into a single feeling. I remember tearing up, not out of fear, but just out of raw emotion. Even now, thinking about it makes my eyes water. Was this the scariest thing I ever encountered? Yes, but at the time, it didn't feel evil. It's so difficult to describe. A few days later, on April 18th, my dad passed away. I never heard the footsteps again. A few more days after he died in the middle of the night, there was a knocking at the front door. Three loud, sharp knocks in succession. No one else in the house woke up to this either. I was the only one to hear the steps as well, though. No one was at the door. The porch was empty. The knocks are something I still continue to hear. Always a series of three. It doesn't matter if I'm at home or in another place entirely. I hear the knocks. At first I thought it was a sign that someone close to me had died, but they've happened at times when no one that I'm aware of has passed or is even sick. After hearing them for 30 or so years, I'm wondering if it's a type of acknowledgement. I do want to be clear, I don't believe that this was a demon or a traditional haunting. As scared as I was, when I continued to think about this years later, there seemed to be a purpose for this. Maybe it was something that was there to help my dad in his passing. I think I met death, which is of course neither good nor evil. It just is. Death is the balance. I doubt that I'll ever have answers for what really happened, but either way, it made a profound impact on my life. In late 2014, early 2015, I worked offshore in Louisiana, and I lived in St. Bernard Parish. I rented a home there. My younger sister and her three young children were also living with me. She was having troubles due to her and her husband separating. I was only home half of the month because my offshore job required me to be out for a week and then home for a week. My sister would tell me while I was home that she had a lot of weird things happening to her and her kids. She couldn't explain it, but decided that it was supernatural, as many of us do when faced with something we cannot explain. I also want to mention something I didn't find out until months later. The house I was renting had been completely underwater during Katrina, and an elderly couple drowned in it. The poor couple decided to stay and take their chances, as many did. St. Bernard Parish was affected more than any other parish near New Orleans, with reports of explosions near the levees. My sister would tell me that she and her kids were experiencing things like locked doors that would fly open and then close again. If anyone in the house was taking a shower, the lights in the bathroom would turn on and off again during the entire shower. I just chalked it up to her being nervous to be alone in the house. That night, as I lay in bed, I suddenly felt a weight pressing on my legs. I assumed it was my sister or one of my nephews. I raised up out of a half-sleep, certain to see either of them and see what was the matter. Instead, all I saw was a concave indentation at the foot of my bed, half on my legs and half on the bed. Being completely exhausted from the prior week, I moved my feet, pulling my legs up into kind of a fetal position. It wasn't easy to move them. The weight was as if a full-grown man was sitting on them. My room had a bathroom in it. I chose it specifically for that reason. Later that night, I got up to use the bathroom, and I heard a male voice say, Get out. Immediately after that, I heard a bang in the kitchen. 
Nervously, I slowly started to sneak toward the kitchen, using my phone's flashlight to navigate. Taking care not to wake my sister and her kids in the room close to the kitchen. Well, apparently she also heard the noise and came out to see what it was. My garbage can, which was under the sink, had been thrown across the room, landing by the living room television. Seconds later, my oldest nephew ran out of his room crying and screaming, He's in our bedroom. He pushed me off the bed. I ran to the room that my sister and her kids were sleeping in, hoping to see nothing. Before I could even cross the doorway, I was knocked off my feet with a punch to my chest. Suddenly, everything we had sitting on the kitchen island began to fly off in all directions. I got to my feet and commanded my sister to help me get the babies. With one of the boys in my arms, I ran to my room to grab my phone and the car keys. When we entered, every single thing I had in that room was laying in a big pile on the floor. Books, bedding, even my television which had previously been attached to the wall. Needless to say, we got out of Dodge fast. We moved out the next day. While packing up our stuff, I called the homeowner and told him I was moving out. I told him the reason, and I expected him to laugh at me, but he didn't. He wasn't surprised at all, actually. I'm sure he's either been through it himself or has had other renters prior to me have the same encounters. I've never experienced anything like that before or since. My sister and I never spoke of it again. Anyway, that's my haunted story. Stay safe out there. My family moved into a new house after my mom got remarried. The houses were built in the 50s, had only one or two previous owners to us. Upon moving in, we all experienced some strange things. Wall sconces being lifted off the hook and thrown across the room. Hearing sighs, voices, and general unease in certain parts of the house. There's no doubt that home was also home to a handful of spirits, however fairly benevolent. As time progressed, my at-the-time stepfather, who I'll call Larry, became increasingly hostile, angry, abusive, and altogether just incredibly nasty. It was known that he had various mental illnesses, including depression, bipolar disorder, and alcoholism. It was a slow progression with him, until the last few extremely bad years, as were the paranormal experiences. Looking back on our situation, there seemed to be an uncanny correlation between his anger and the spiritual turmoil. Many of the unsettling occurrences were directly related to him also. The first doppelganger experience that occurred was one morning when my father picked me up for his weekend visitation. About an hour after we left, my mom and Larry both heard my voice clearly calling Larry's name from outside. Only his name, which was unlike me because I never had a good relationship with him. They got up to inspect and eventually called to ask just to find out that my dad and I were already in the other state that my dad lived in. The second was one super cold night, right after my younger sister was born. My mom had run out for some reason, and I was on the couch with Larry watching TV while he was feeding my newborn sister. My mother came inside to ask what Larry was doing out there, saying that she saw him kicking through the snow in his very distinct eagle's jacket. He disappeared behind the cars as my mom drove up the street, and she assumed that he had used a different door than the front to get back inside. But he was next to me the entire time she was gone. My mom has many stories about how their bed would vibrate and shake in the middle of the night and wake them up, but has a particularly unsettling middle of the night story. She was awake, but Larry was asleep. As she laid there, she says a black shadowy mass spilled into their room from under the door 
traveled up the wall and over the bed to above him, then completely disappeared. My younger sister says that she saw the exact same shadowy mass at his new apartment while visiting him after he and my mom split. Other than me, the rest of my family is incredibly religious, and they don't really believe in ghosts, so I don't know why they would make up stories like these if they didn't happen. The last few years of their marriage were the worst with his violence, anger, and volatility, as was the horrible, thick feeling of bad energy in the home. It became normal to us to hear things, see things fly off shelves and tables, and to feel absolutely terrified and nauseated to be in certain parts of the house. Since their divorce, we all moved out, and my mom has only experienced one possibly paranormal experience. She was laying on the couch at night, and I happened to be visiting. I was in my sister's room when we heard my mom yelling, Larry! Larry? Then flipping out and running into the room. She claimed to have seen him clear as day, leaning over her, and for a split second, she forgot they were even divorced and that he shouldn't have been there. She said he went into the kitchen and she came running for us, but after a thorough search of the apartment, absolutely nobody was there. Our theory is one of two things. One, he's got some sort of demonic, negative, paranormal energy attached to him, his mental illness and inability to control himself leads us to believe that he was a weak target for attachment. The anger and straight-up deplorable things he's done to my family makes it easy for us to believe this. In addition, it's commonly believed that demonic presences are the only ones able to mimic one's voice and appearance. Maybe we're just reaching for a reason to push his horrible deeds onto something paranormal to not believe that a person is capable of such things. The second theory is that his extreme and uncontrolled energy has manifested itself into some sort of poltergeist activity, explaining all of the noises, movement, visions, and bad energy. We're not really sure what's going on, but it was terrifying. Short story, but my grandmother lived with us for a few years, and when she would visit, she stayed in our guest bedroom. Because of old age, she had trouble going up the stairs, so we installed a stair lift. My grandma hated it when anybody besides her used it. Being 10 or 11 years old, my friends and I thought it was fun, and they always wanted to use it. My grandma passed when I was 13. On my next birthday, 14, my friends all came over for my birthday party. Everyone lined up to use the stair lift. Since my grandma had passed away, it was no longer in use, and I figured, why not let them use it? I was standing at the top of my stairs, and my friends were at the bottom, with one person going up the stairs on the lift. That's when a ceramic framed painting suddenly flew off the wall and shattered. It was right outside the room that my grandma always stayed in. It was a painting hung in a way that you had to lift up a wire off of a nail in order to take it down, and the nail was at a sloped angle, basically pegging it to the wall. There's no way that gravity could have been the cause of this fall. I like to think it was my grandma coming back to say, don't use my stair lift, because it was something that truly bothered her. Either way, it wasn't scary, but comforting knowing that she was still around, looking out for and watching over us. It was a clear night about five or so years ago, and I presume I was driving home from a friend's house. As I'm driving, I felt this strange, powerful energy around me, and since I'm pretty sensitive to energies, I knew that that's what this feeling was. However, I've never had this feeling while driving alone in my car at night. 
So a few moments go by of this almost weighted feeling of someone in the car with me when my eyes are drawn to the airbag light turning on. Now this light only comes on when there's a passenger or something like a big purse sitting on the seat. But this particular night, the passenger seat was completely empty. I quickly realized someone was sitting in the car with me, but they felt comforting and not at all scary or evil. I then had the urge to reach my right hand out. I don't know where that urge came from, but before I had time to second guess it, my hand was extended over the center console. Then I felt what I can only describe as someone holding my hand firmly and warm. As I felt this energy wrap around my hand, I started to tear up a bit. I believe I said, hello, who are you, out loud, but I might have been speaking to them in my head. I don't remember. After another moment, my hand felt empty. The airbag light went off, and I knew that they were gone. To this day, I have no idea who this person or entity was, or why they wanted to come and see me. But it was a special moment that felt important to both of us. This is not my experience, but I heard it from my father firsthand, and it sure is scary as heck. My father spent most of his childhood years in the village, from elementary school to the third grade. This happened when he was like nine or ten years old, as he remembers. I need to mention that he was never a religious person or anything like that, but he had a very realistic perspective on life. He was definitely logic-based. He never told this incident to anyone other than his mother when he was young, but when he heard similar stories from his relatives from the village about that specific area, he believed that his experience was probably not a dream or a hallucination. My father's house was outside of the village and also on top of the hill. It was difficult to reach their house on foot, but there was a shortcut that goes around the hill, and people who knew about the shortcut would sometimes prefer to use that path. It was a pathway rather than a road, narrow but less rough than the other roads. Those who knew about this road also knew that the path was a bit uncanny. It didn't really have a very clean past. There's a story about that road that my father heard from his father. Four or more centuries ago, around when the Mongol invasion of Anatolia happened, Mongolians attacked this village and killed every living being in the village. They put their heads on spikes along the path. People used to call this place Kabatas because it is also full of steep and sharp little stones. It means rough stones in Turkish. The thing is, nobody would want to use this path if it wasn't really necessary. Again, because of its unpleasant past. One summer afternoon, my father started walking toward his house, and he opted for the shortcut because he had to hurry. The road wasn't that long and he could get there faster. There were even neighbors living in their own houses just beyond the bifurcation at the end of the road. He walked a little more on the stony road and then stopped. More precisely, he had to stop. A stony wall appeared right in front of him, a wall that had never been there before. Why would anyone build a wall on that narrow pathway anyway, he asked himself. But the path continued just behind the wall, after all. It was like a newly knitted wall. His first thought was, maybe the neighbors put it there. But why would they? Also, the wall wasn't very long. The height of the wall was maybe 150 to 160 centimeters, and the length of the wall was maybe 200 centimeters. But of course, that was beyond the height of my father, who was still a small child. Still, he figured that in two moves he could climb the wall and get over it. There was no passing from the right or the left of the wall, and as the weather started to get dark and stormy, he wanted to climb the wall and continue on his way in order to get home quickly. When he climbed the wall and gave his hand to where he thought the stones would be over, he realized that the wall wasn't done yet. 
No matter how hard he tried to climb up, he couldn't reach the top of it. It seemed ridiculous. He thought, maybe it's my shoes. Maybe they're not good enough to climb and reach the top. But he was sure that he'd been firmly on his feet when he touched the top that wasn't the top. He kept saying to himself, how is this possible? Why is it not ending? By this time, he was tired of climbing. He had a growing sensation within him that somebody was watching him, maybe toying with him. He was starting to get scared. The sky was almost dark. He thought, it would be bad if I fall. I would break all my bones. Even though he'd never been religious, he started to pray to God. Then he fell to the ground with a bang. The wall collapsed on its own, and my father was buried under the rubble. He couldn't get up from the ground. He thinks that he passed out there. A few hours later, my uncle saw my father lying there, a little boy half of his body under the stones. He picked up my dad and carried him home. He tells my grandma where he found my dad, and my grandma said, Oh, my son, were you so tired? Haven't you found another place to sleep than that cursed land? My father told her about what happened to him. There's a widespread belief in that region, especially expressed by the ancients, that if you are wandering alone in a deserted place like that, something will come and play games with you, like the short wall that never ends when you climb it. When I was about 15, my mom came home from work on a Saturday night to find my dad and I in the kitchen making dinner. She was excited because she had just gotten a promotion and had gotten the keys to her place of work, which she would be using for the first time the next morning. She put them down on the counter with her other keys and went upstairs to change. Fast forward to after dinner, my mom is getting everything organized for work the next morning and we're in the family room in the basement, picking a movie to watch. Suddenly, my mom goes, Has anyone seen my work keys? Immediately, my dad and I remind her that she put them on the counter when she came in. Yeah, I know, she says, but they're not there. So, of course, the three of us spent forever searching the house top to bottom for these keys. We looked in her purse, all over the kitchen, in the car, in the cupboards, pretty much anywhere we could think of. The keys were nowhere to be found. My mom concludes that they must still be at work, despite all of us having seen her bring them home and set them on the counter. She resolves to call her boss in the morning if they still haven't turned up. A little later, my mom is looking at outfits for the next day, and I'm laying on her bed playing with the cat. My mom takes a big, slightly fancier purse out of her closet which she hasn't used in at least six months because, well, it's fancy and somewhat expensive. And in her mind, that meant it was not for everyday use. But tomorrow was special. She reaches into the purse to put her work things in it and her hand comes back out, holding the lost keys. We were all stunned and neither of my parents ever mentioned it again, no matter how many times I bring up the ghostly happenings in our house. Twenty-five years ago, I moved in with my cousin and her roommate and co-worker named Jose. The house was an old cement block, three-bedroom, one-bath house with a large fenced yard. He had two very large German shepherds that lived there and were mostly in the yard. The house is in Carmel, Florida, in a shitty, packed suburban neighborhood. Nothing special. Rent was cheap, 50 bucks a week from what I remember, and the house was clean. Plus, my cousin lived there too, so I moved in. We all got along well. Everyone worked. We pretty much kept to ourselves and saw each other for a few minutes here and there. I lived there for about six months. This is the story of what caused me to move out. On a weekend night, we all happened to be off from work. 
we decided to invite some friends over from the pool hall that we frequented, and Jose invited some people over that worked at the pharmaceutical lab. There were probably 20 people there total. We played music and did what young people do. Eventually it got pretty late and we found ourselves talking about ghosts. We all shared stories. My cousin and I came from a pretty spooky family, so we had some good ones. And everybody was really into the discussion. Jose was quiet throughout most of the conversation. He waited until we had all kind of quieted down. And then he said, You know, this house is haunted. My cousin and I shot each other a look and then both laughed because, yeah, sometimes Jose's 20-pound house cat would meow at the empty hallway, but other than that, that was it. He proceeded to tell us that there was a presence in the house, but that it mostly stayed in the shed in the backyard. This tiny little pink wooden shed that I had never even looked in. He told us he always keeps the curtains in his bedroom closed because his window faces the shed, and the door to the shed will not stay shut. He has jammed it shut a million times, and it always pops back open. It creeps him out. He said he could tell when it was in the house, because he would wake up feeling depressed. It creeped me out. I didn't want to think that I lived with a presence, and I didn't like the idea that it was hurting my roommate. I was a tough chick in my opinion, so I was like, screw that ghost, I'll shut that door, and you won't have to keep your curtains closed anymore. I said all this because in my heart, I didn't really believe that anything was in the shed or the house. I believed we were all just messing around. So I told them all that I was going to go outside to inspect the shed and deal with the door. Everyone followed me and while we were walking around the outside of the house, Jose told me that it was a really bad idea to mess with the shed, that whatever it was wanted that door open and I should just leave it alone. We all got out there, and it was exactly what I thought it was going to be. A very worn down wooden shed that oddly kind of looked like a tiny house more than a shed. I looked inside and there was a busted lawnmower and some old paint buckets, rusty screens, and darkness. I looked around outside and found some rusty shovels in a corner of the garage. I took a shovel over to the shed. I kicked the door of the shed back into the frame. The door was closed and literally kicked into the frame, kicked shut. I took the handle of the shovel and I put it under the handle of the shed door. I shoved that into the ground. It was secure. We all went back inside. We BS'd some more, but it was late, I'm gonna say around 1am, by the time we go back in and everybody said their goodbyes. We let the dogs out of their pen in the yard and locked the gate. We made sure that the front gate was secured so that they wouldn't get out, and then we straightened up the house a little and eventually we all went to bed. Sometime around 6am I woke up because I needed to use the bathroom. I opened my bedroom door, and I was sleepy, but there was a weird sound as I opened it. It startled me. It was like fingernails scraping on something coarse. I opened the door all the way and the shovel fell in the door and hit me. I can't even put into words how I felt in that moment. That shovel had been standing against my bedroom door from the outside, and there was a tiny pile of dirt where the tip had been sat against the tile floor of the hallway. I rushed through the house to the side door, which was locked, and then out to the backyard. The shed door was wide open. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I ran back into the house. I immediately pounded on both Jose and my cousin's bedroom door. I was terrified and angry because I knew, I mean I absolutely knew, that one of them had done this. Now I know that you couldn't have been there to see the reactions, but I promise you, based on them, neither of them did it. Jose literally broke down sobbing. He begged me to tell him I was lying. He begged my cousin to admit that she had done it. When neither of us took responsibility, he went to the store and got a bunch of religious candles, produced a rosary, and started trying to pray away whatever it was. Or pray for me for being dumb. My Spanish wasn't even close to fluent enough to keep up with his prayers. My cousin, on the other hand, was pissed. 
She was ready to fight me. She was adamant that I was pulling a prank, cussed me up and down, called me a liar, said I was a child, that most of all, she didn't appreciate being woken up at 6 a.m. after a night of partying to be a pawn in my prank. When I knew that neither of them had put the shovel against the door or reopened the shed door, I was literally terrified. There was no way someone else got into the yard, past the dogs, got to the shed door, opened it, got into the locked house, and then put that shovel against my door. I didn't sleep there again without someone else in the room with me. Every moment spent there after that was beyond tense. We all kind of stopped talking to each other, and Jose and my cousin ended up in a terrible argument over a button on the stereo of all things, and she moved out within a week. It took me two weeks to find another place to live, and I never went back. This is a family story that happened sometime in the late 80s, I believe. For context, I have a huge family, German-Irish Catholic. And growing up, we always had big family parties for birthdays, holidays, and other events. My mom, several aunts, grandma, and great-grandma were at my grandma's house cleaning up after a party late at night. It was probably 10 or 11. My great-grandma went to bed. She lived with my grandparents due to dementia and the lack of resources for the elderly during that time. My great-grandma came out to the living room in her nightgown and said, There's a man outside of my window. Understandably disturbed, a few of the group go into her room and look outside the window. The backyard is not very large. It was mostly ivy and gardens. There is an iron bench with a vintage lamp post next to it had a very early 1900s look to it. There was no sign of anyone outside. Chalking it up to dementia, my grandma said, there's no one there. It's okay, go back to bed. The group continued cleaning while listening to music and goofing around. My great grandma came out again and said there was a man outside her window. The group walked back into her bedroom to look out the window once more there was an exchange between my grandma and my great-grandma. Where is the man that you're seeing? My grandma asked. He just knocked on the window. He wants me to come outside, said my great-grandmother. What does he look like? asked my grandma. Oh, he's very handsome. He's wearing an all-white suit with a top hat and white shoes. He wants me to come outside and meet the lady. What lady? My grandma asked her. The pretty lady on the bench, don't you see her? She's wearing a very nice pink dress. At this point, my mom, aunts, and grandma are pretty freaked out. They turn on every light and search the backyard. There's no sign of anyone or of anyone having been there. Everyone decides that her dementia is progressing faster than they thought and they called it a night. The next morning, my grandma gets a phone call from some family in California. They were calling to say that my great-grandma's sister had passed the night before. My grandma was obviously upset, especially because as far as she knew, her aunt was in relatively good health. My grandma composed herself and asked, Was she sick? What happened? The family member from California said, Not as far as we know but she must have known it was coming. Why do you say that? My grandma asked. Because she fell asleep in her bed that night, wearing her favorite pink dress. I've never had any kind of supernatural experience, and I'm generally a skeptic, but something happened that gave me chills. My wife and I live in a newly built home that we built, and we have infant twins. They sleep in the same room, but in separate cribs. They sleep roughly from 7.30 at night to 6.30 in the morning. We leave on a relatively silent humidifier, 
a baby monitor, and a white noise machine. Recently, Twin B was having a rough night. He was constantly awake and screaming. Normally, he sleeps well. We kept going in and settling him, only to have him wake up again shortly after, crying. At around 2 to 3 a.m., he woke up again. Neither my wife nor I immediately got up. I just thought I'd see if he'd cry it out in a little bit. At that time, I heard a very distinct shh from the baby monitor. I was so tired that I thought I either imagined it or it was the white noise machine, although this sound was very distinct from that machine. The next day, later in the day, my wife mentioned to me that she had a bit of a fright because she heard shushing coming from the baby monitor and thought that I was in the nursery. But then she looked over and I was sleeping beside her. I told her I heard the exact same thing. I actually hadn't really thought about the incident until my wife told me this. We both heard it. The baby monitors are not on Wi-Fi and we live in a pretty rural area. I'm sure there's an explanation, but this is the first time in my life that I've actually had chills from an occurrence like this. This happened to me around six years back, when I was visiting family in Alaska. I was borrowing a car to go visit some family when I lost control on a two-lane highway and hit a tree. I was freezing cold, and there was no point in staying in my car because the windows were smashed. I was scared. It was night, and I had no way of calling for help. When I saw some headlights coming down the highway, I got out an emergency light and flagged the person down. It turned out to be some old Max Semi. A big guy opened the door and let me in. He asked if I was right, and I told him I was fine, but I had crashed, and I thanked him very much for helping me out of the cold. I told him my name, and he said that his name was Bill. He ended up dropping me off in a small town ten miles ahead, and told me he had to go. I thanked him again, and I went inside a small restaurant. I told him that some trucker named Bill helped me out. They all got a very strange look. They told me that that was impossible, because the only trucker who drove those roads named Bill had died in an accident six years prior to that day. I got chills. It's very weird, and I still don't believe in ghosts, but mine and the bartender's descriptions matched perfectly. No matter what I do, I can't disprove what happened that night. In case anyone was wondering, the bartender said that Bill had jackknifed on the highway to avoid someone who spun out on the road. Alaska drivers, please be careful. When I was a young kid, had to be around four or so, we lived in a small house in Florida. My parents had bought the house right before I was born. I vividly remember going into my bedroom one day and sitting on my bed. There was a window directly across from my bed and the sun was shining through it. I remember pulling out a blue notebook that I loved. It had stickers all over it and I started to draw. All of a sudden, I remember getting up and walking into my closet. I have no idea why I got up and went into my closet, but once I'd gone through the door, I wasn't in my closet. I was walking down a path made up of pebbles, and all around me were tables with yellow umbrellas, like patio tables that have the hole in the middle for the umbrella. The sun was shining brightly and people were talking and laughing and I could hear water splashing. For some reason, I remember feeling really happy and excited about this cool place. I couldn't see a pool, but I could hear the water and the splashing, and see these tables with the umbrellas and even feel the sun. I loved going to the pool, and everything felt safe, and it was so sunny, and I felt really happy. I look up to see a man on a very tall chair. He looked down at me with the kindest eyes and gave me a little wave. I remembered that I waved back, but I started to look around 
curious as to where I could go swimming too. The next thing I remember, I was back sitting on my bed and the sun was still shining in the window and the notebook was on my lap. I felt so sad and disappointed. Being four, I went out of my room and found my mom and demanded to know if we used to have a pool and tables with yellow umbrellas. I remember this as clear as can be. She paid me very little attention but laughed and said no, we never had a pool or tables with an umbrella. I remember being super disappointed that there was no cool water park or whatever that I could access from my closet. Fast forward many years, many years, to when I was grown and married with two kids of my own. We had moved to Texas when I was a teenager. My mom and I are looking through old photos and there's a picture of our house in Florida taken from the outside. My mom says something like, do you remember much about that house? I said, yes, actually, I remember a lot about living there. She says, your dad and I bought that house from a lady whose husband had died. He had been a lifeguard and actually wound up saving someone and then promptly had a heart attack right beside the pool. The memory of going into my closet at four years old did not immediately return to me. I had all but forgotten about it and probably chalked it up to being a dream. But later it hit me. My mom had never told me about the lady she bought the house from. Not until that moment when I was much older. The whole thing came back to me and how I couldn't have been asleep. I remembered the bed and the window and the notebook so clearly. I also remember feeling so excited about what I was seeing and so disappointed when it went away. Looking back, the tall chair I saw had to be a lifeguard's chair. It was crazy, and to this day, I have no explanation. When I was around 10, my family decided to make the change to move to a small town in Northern California along with my grandparents. Since the moment we moved there, I always thought the place was strange. I have a younger brother, and for the majority of the time we lived in the new house, he would act somewhat odd. He would often be playing with an imaginary friend, and my parents and I always blew it off as him just being young, who didn't have one. But some of the things he would say would leave us pondering who or what he was actually interacting with. For the most part, whenever we would ask him who he was playing with, he would always say it was his friend, or more disturbingly, his dead brother. I was always left in awe, since as far as I knew, it was just the two of us. I even questioned my parents if they had lost any children and they always denied it. At times when it was time to go to sleep, my brother would refuse because he was playing with his friend, and on one occasion, he asked if his friend could sleep next to him. He was still young, so he slept in my parents' room. My mom was somewhat done with him talking about his friend, so he told him to tell his friend to get the hell out of there. The moment she said that, the show she was watching on TV turned to pure static. She got terrified and immediately tried to turn off her television. It wouldn't shut off or change channels, and she was left with having to unplug it in order to cut the noise off. For the rest of the night, she was completely unable to go to sleep, and she told me her experience on the way to drop me off at the bus stop. There's also a local Chinese cemetery close to where we live, and a lot of times my brother would always say that that's where his dead brother lived. I often had to tell him to stop saying things like that, since it spooked my mom, and me. Once he started to get older, he stopped playing with his friend, and other things around the house started to happen. At times you could hear whispers in the home. Sometimes doors would close by themselves. You would hear walking outside by the windows. As I got older and I started high school, we moved over to the neighboring town and my grandparents bought the house that we lived in. My uncle was recently divorced and he moved back in with my grandparents, so he was often home. 
My parents, being Mexican, always had their ritual of going to Mexico to go home to visit family during the holidays. So on one occasion, I decided not to go with them, and my uncle was left to look after me. It was just us at the house, and he had the knack of staying up all night and watching TV, so I only saw him after I got home. Me having to be up early in the morning would just be lounging around the house, waiting for it to be time for me to walk to the bus stop. On one of these mornings, I decided it was a good idea to get up close and personal to an angel figurine my grandmother had in the room I was staying in. As my face got closer to it, all of a sudden I heard a loud, hey, in front of me. It startled me so badly that I jumped up and almost fell on my back. I had no explanation as to what had just happened, so I rushed over to my uncle's room thinking it was a prank. I tried to go into his room, but I wasn't able to since it was locked. Having no explanation, I just decided to leave and wait outside. That was my last experience there at the house. My grandparents sold the house and moved to the same town we live in now, and all of these things were somewhat forgotten. Many years later, me being 23 now and working at a warehouse for an electronics company, made a friend with a person who also happened to have gone to the same trade school that I had attended. On one occasion, just chatting, we started to talk about paranormal things. He started to tell me how his younger sister had an imaginary friend, and strange things happened at his house. I was kind of a jokester, so I decided to play a prank on him. I knew he lived in the same town where I used to live, but I had no clue where. I started to describe my old house, and he just kept staring at me in disbelief, until I told him, Oh, you lived at such and such a road in such and such California at this zip code. He started laughing. He said, what are you doing? Stalking me? Following me home? I was like, wait a minute, you live there? He confirmed, and I told him that that was my childhood home. After that, I told him that my brother had also had an imaginary friend while we lived there, and also heard all the whispers that he and his brother here coming from the walls. The doors had also closed and slammed on us. He also confirmed one thing that I had never told my parents or my brother until years later, that I had seen shadows moving around inside the house. My buddy stated that he sees them too. What got to me the most of him telling me all these things that have happened to his family there isn't that it's the same things my family experienced, that I got validation that we weren't crazy. I still talk to my buddy to this day, and he still hears and sees the same things. The last thing that reminded me about that home was an old photo my brother dug up from my parents' closet. My mother had the hobby of taking pictures of everyone and everything, so we have albums on top of albums. The picture my brother decided to take out was one where we were celebrating my brother's birthday. My uncles, brother, and myself are all posing in the picture. And in the window next to us, you can see a whitish face pressed up against the glass from the outside and handprints on either side. My family and I have always been animal lovers. I've never known a time when we didn't have cats or dogs with us, and I feel like they helped raise me. When my father was in college, he adopted two cats named Tigger and Sato. Tigger passed away due to a coyote, and after she passed, Sato was never the same. She was grumpy and preferred to be by herself, but I would annoy her with my love anyway. One night, I was carrying her in her wicker basket with some blankets. I would bring her room to room as I cleaned up everything and did my normal things. I'd been petting her and listening to her purr when she suddenly stopped moving. I was maybe 12, and I remember praying for the first time to bring her back to me. It was awful to bring her out to my mom and tell her she had passed. 
I had a tradition whenever a pet died that I would make a concrete headstone with little marbles and their names on them. I had it set out on our kitchen counter to dry and left it there. The next morning I checked on it and found a small piece of her fur right in the center. I went around to everybody and asked if they had placed it there, and they all said that they hadn't. I felt like she was giving me one last piece of her. I kept it in a tiny knick-knack tea kettle, and it lives there with a few of her whiskers I found weeks following her passing. In a way, I think she gave me one last gift. A month ago, my neighbor passed away in her sleep. She was kind and always made a point to say hi to everyone and wish everybody a blessed day. She even went out of her way to wish me a Merry Christmas when I got home from the hospital last year on Christmas Eve. After her passing, weird things started happening, and it's not just in my apartment. My other neighbors, there's eight households in our building, have all experienced weird things. It started with hearing someone shuffle up and down my hallway, which I believed was my roommate at the time. I later found out that he wasn't even home at night because he worked overnights during that month, so it couldn't have been him. Once my roommate moved out, the activity got weirder and weirder. I started hearing someone knock on the door every morning at 3 a.m. We would check and no one would be there. At first we thought we were being ding-dong ditched, until we heard a knock, went to go check, saw no one, and then as we were closing the door, heard the knock again. The door was still partially open, so we knew that there wasn't anyone there to do it. After that, I started having trouble sleeping. Even now, I only sleep two hours a night if I'm lucky. Because of this, I'm usually the witness of it all. I think that whatever is here knows that. I've heard doors opening and closing, my windows sliding open, and my drawers on my dresser slamming shut. The most profound experience was when my fiancé and I were just going to bed and hadn't turned off the light yet, when a shadow figure ran into our room and headed straight for the closet. We both sat, frozen in fear, and watched the closet door for a few minutes. Once we calmed down, he laid down, and in between us, we heard someone whisper, What are you doing tomorrow? Clear as day. The weird thing about all of this is that I know the shadow and the things that happening aren't my neighbor. Yet they all started when she died. My neighbors say that they hear knocking and running too, but they didn't say anything about ghosts or shadow people. They all said it's probably some kids doing the ding-dong ditch thing. I don't think it's people doing it unless kids have found a way to become invisible while knocking on doors. Even as I'm typing the story, I hear loud footsteps in the hallway. There's no one here. I have the door open, and I don't see a single person. I'm honestly terrified. I think we're being haunted by something. But it's far too creepy and evil feeling to be my nice neighbor. I used to clean offices back when I was a student going to university. It was a great job for students because they didn't really care when you showed up. As long as you got the job done between the closed hours of 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. This one law office I cleaned every Thursday was pretty cool by design, but it always spooked me out. The building was about six stories high, and the law firm being on top had a beautiful view. It was a heritage building, located in what was the city's original town square. I was told that it was where the town hangings had once occurred, and the particular building I worked in was at one time a brothel. 
So lots of history, and that history alone made me want to get the job done as early as possible. The whole sixth floor would usually take me about an hour to clean. I usually managed to be out of there by eight or nine at the latest, usually taking a beautiful sunset too. This night I had stayed late at school and arrived at the job well after dark and close to midnight. The layout of this law firm was a circle. You take the elevator up with your cart and the door is open to a reception and waiting area. To the right were the washrooms and then individual law offices circled around the floor with a large boardroom in the middle and a staff break room at the opposite end. A strange feeling usually hit me as soon as the elevator doors opened. This weird feeling of someone there, but the stillness of the vacant space kept reassuring you that that was crazy talk. The later in the evening it was, the stronger the feeling. I was not looking forward to this next hour. This night, the doors opened and I could hear people talking and laughing. It sounded like ladies were working late and chatting it up in the break room. I remember smiling with relief because I was feeling pretty scared to be there alone so late. I walked around the right side calling out hello to let them know that I was there and to not surprise them. As I rounded the corner to the break room, the talking sounds just stopped and absolutely no one was there. I stood there frozen for a moment and thought maybe they were in the offices on the left, so I kept going. I kept calling out hello and announcing my presence. No one was in the building at all, but the chatter that I had just heard was clear as day. As I came full circle back to the elevator, I kid you not, the elevator doors opened by themselves. I was so frightened that I just pushed the cart back onto the elevator and went home. Nope, nope, nope. When I was about 14, we had this house with this old attic that always creaked quietly. No one ever went up there because it was always locked. But one night when my parents were out of town, my friend Cameron slept over. We were playing video games and watching TV like we always have. At around 8 o'clock p.m., we heard what sounded like footsteps in the attic. We were too nervous to go and check, so we just brushed it off as the house settling and went back to watching TV. Then, about 15 minutes later, we heard a heavy slam and a shatter like glass breaking from the kitchen. We ran out to go check, but when we got to the kitchen, there was nothing. No glass, nothing was out of place or broken, so we just looked at each other, confused, and walked away went back to watching TV. At around 10 p.m., we heard loud footsteps from upstairs, so we got up and checked all the rooms. But when we reached the stairs to the attic, we stopped. He pulled out his flashlight, and when he pointed it toward the top of the stairs, we both stopped and got really pale, because what we saw was a tall black figure that had to be at least seven or eight feet tall. It just stood there, staring at us, and then it vanished into thin air right in front of our eyes. That's when we ran outside and called the cops. We left out the part about it vanishing in front of us. We just said that there was someone in the attic. They checked the entire house and said that there were no signs of anyone being there. After retiring from the service in 2009, I was in Iraq working as a contractor. My job entailed traveling all over the country, making sure specific things got done. Sounds like a lot, but it really wasn't. In the end of August of that year, I was detailed up to Mosul. I traveled, worked out the issues, and on the way back, I was directed to go through Balad to hitch a ride to Baghdad. While waiting for the ride in the air terminal, there was a battalion of army support folks 
who were also traveling. Many of them were sick, coughing and hacking up a lung. I tried to stay as far away from them as I could. My travel continued without them, but I was to live to regret it. A week later, I came down with swine flu, thanks to all that coughing and hacking. I went to the doctor on post, and because I was retired military, I was seen. He said that I was to immediately go into quarantine. My barracks did not have individual bathrooms, so I was led to the truck by my buddy and driven the five miles to the other side of the base complex to Camp Liberty. I was sent down the road past the PX, on down to the right-hand side past the Y, if you have been there you will understand, and almost to the end of the road, two large campsites short, down by the wreck yard, where they brought all the destroyed vehicles. Then, way back, to almost the eastern outside wall of the camp, I was one camp short of the wall. The camps were about 20 trailers long, all surrounded by concrete T-walls. You could drive between the rows. Then 10 of those rows wide made up a camp, with a large space to drive semi-trucks between each camp. My hut was the one on the end. It connected to another living space through a shared bathroom. My buddy kicked me out of the truck and I walked between the T-walls up to the door and opened it. The dust on the floor didn't bother me at first. Everything is dusty in Iraq. My buddy followed me in and we looked at the dusty, dusty accommodations. I walked over and flipped the mattress over to a clean side and sat down. The room had a desk, a walk-in closet, and the shared bathroom. It also had an air conditioner that, when turned on, pumped out very cool, sweet-smelling air. It was then when I noticed the calendar hanging on the wall, July 2007, two years before. My buddy told me that he would go and pick up my poncho liner and laptop that was in my day pack so that I could watch movies while I waited out my seven days of quarantine. He also told me that he would bring me meals during the days that I was staying there. I thanked him and he left. It was mid-afternoon and I was tired, so I laid down and tried to breathe while resting, feeling sick as a dog. It was then in the quiet that I thought I heard someone talking outside. I couldn't catch the conversation, which bothered me some, as I couldn't hear if they were speaking English or Farsi. The hut door was locked and I went on through the bathroom to see if the other hut door was locked, which it was. I kept the lights off so that nobody would know that I was there and come looking. When my buddy came back, I told him what had happened. It was getting dark by then. He had brought my laptop, poncho liner, and as an afterthought, he included a nice tanto knife I traveled with as I was not supposed to have a firearm for some reason. He left and I curled up in my poncho liner, and soon I was fast asleep. I woke later that night sleeping on my side facing the wall. It had grown quite dark in the room. Still facing the wall, I could hear voices speaking quite softly, but this time distinctly. You ask him. No, you ask him. At this point, I was wide awake and staring at the wall. Did I forget to lock the door? Who was in here with me? Something kicked the bed frame, and I thought somebody was trying to figure out why I was sleeping in their room. So I rolled over and looked around, but no one was there. I got up and checked the doors and under the bed. You could say that I was somewhat shaken by the encounter thus far. After everything was checked, including the closet, I turned on the closet light, but I left it cracked open a bit. So I was in the shadows in the room, and the room was light so I could see the rest of it. If somebody was messing with me, I was not going to take it. I was sick and feeling pretty crappy and just over it. This time I wrapped up in the poncho liner facing the room. Things got quiet after a while, so I drifted off to sleep. I was awakened again about an hour later by these same voices asking the same thing. Only, this time, a voice stated clearly, I'll ask him. It was at this time that I was laying on my back, and something climbed up onto my bed and sat on my feet 
like you would do during the sit-up event for PT. Needless to say, I was wide awake, and they had my full attention. With a sharp intake of breath, what or whoever was sitting on my feet jumped off. I sat up, and there was nobody in the room that I could see. The smell in the room, which was cool and dusty, turned into a sharp, burned smell. I thought it was coming from the air conditioner, so I got up to check. When my back was turned, I heard the voice say distinctly, Ask him. I told them in my best SGM voice to stand easy and I would be with them in a minute. I walked to the door and went outside, leaving the door open. It was early morning and around 4 a.m. The sun was just starting to light up the sky. I sat down on the steps and waited for my buddy. At 6 o'clock a.m. he showed up and looked at me strangely, asking why I was out on the steps as he handed my breakfast to me. I told him we were leaving. He laughed and said, No, you have six more days of quarantine. Go back inside and relax. I looked at him and said, No, I'm good. He found me sitting in the shade of the tea wall for lunch, same for dinner. He was starting to wonder what was going on. I told him, I'll tell you if you take me away from here. He just laughed as he drove away. The same thing happened to me that night, and more. The next day I was sitting on the steps when four soldiers carried a private by the legs and arms into the room next to me and flung him on the bed. They dropped a box of MREs and a 12-pack of water, and laughing said, Later, loser. I stayed outside till around 2300 hours, and then I went in and prepped for the nightly activities. The following morning at about 5 a.m., I was sitting out on the steps when the door to the other hut burst open and a very scared private ran out. He looked left, then right, breathing pretty hard like he had just run a marathon. I smiled at him and said, How's it going? He sat down and tried to light a cigarette, but his hands were shaking so badly he couldn't light the match and gave up after a few seconds. I could tell he was pretty shaken up by something. He looked right at me and said, D Did you? I said, You met them too, I see. And he calmed down a little. I said, I don't think they're going to do any harm to you, but it is a little unsettling. He said, Yeah, I'm leaving. They can't make me stay here. I laughed and said that I had four more days and could use the company. His mind was made up, and when it got light, he went and packed up all his stuff and left. My buddy was true to his word, and each day he brought me breakfast, lunch, and dinner like clockwork. Each time, finding me sitting on the steps or in the shade with the door open, waiting. Finally, on the last day, he came by for lunch and said, Time to leave so we can go get pizza. I had all my stuff packed and shut the door and jumped in the truck. He asked, Now are you going to tell me what's going on? I told him, Not until we are far away from this place. We drove over to the belaying office to give the key back. We went inside and had to wait as a tall, muscular Army CW4 was chewing out one of his soldiers. He was not in a good mood. When he was done, I walked up and introduced myself as the guy staying in the quarantine hut. He asked if there were any problems as he reached out for the key. I looked him in the eye, and as he grabbed the key, I hung on and said, Chief... You need to cut that key and the key to the other side of that hut in half and never issue it to anyone again. He was not amused, asking if anything was wrong with the hut. I said, you just go and spend one night there and you'll understand why I'm telling you to cut those keys up. He got pissed and took the keys. I left with my buddy looking at me like I'd lost my mind. At pizza an hour later, I told my buddy what had happened that whole week, leaving nothing out. He thought I was full of crap. A week later, I was walking through the PX at Camp Liberty, looking at all the pod over items, thinking if I could use another t-shirt with a slogan on it, or a new 501 shirt with my buddy in tow, when down the aisle, I see the chief running at me. He grabs my arm and says, I cut the keys in half. I cut him in half, and no one under any circumstance will stay in those huts ever again. 
This shocked and surprised my buddy. The chief said he was pissed at me when I turned in the key, thinking I had trashed the place. We went over to check it out. It was getting dusk when he left. He found the rooms neat and tidy, but also found them, and they wanted to talk with him. I later learned that the camp was handed over to the Iraqi army. I always wondered who got those rooms, and just how that went for them. In summary, I think it was a unique experience. I think that there were approximately 7 to 10 distinct individual entities present at any given time during my stay. They never followed me outside or into the bathroom, which was nice of them. They did go from room to room where people were staying, making themselves known. It was usually in the late evening to early morning, usually gone before the sun was up. I felt that I couldn't really help them, but I did tell them that they were quite possibly dead and that they needed to move on. I didn't get any names from any of them. It just seemed that it wasn't important to them to tell me. It was more of a, can you see me and do I exist type of experience. I've thought on this many times and I've told a few people. Most think it was made up because I was sick. I don't think so. Usually when I'm sick, I dream about fly fishing in cool mountain streams, not ghosts chatting with me. The private and the chief were also involved and I didn't know either of them before I was sent to quarantine. And when the chief was in there, he wasn't even sick. So, who knows? This is the first ghost encounter I can remember. From around age two to five, my family moved into an older rental home. In the brick house next door was a nice family with little kids around our ages. I barely remember them, but everyone else remembers that they were very friendly. One day, my mom and I walked to a nearby convenience store. We were almost back home when we saw an old woman in the neighbor's front living room window. We could see her pretty well from the sidewalk. It was so long ago, but with my mom's memory, I can say she wore a dress or a robe. Her hair was pulled back, and she was rocking back and forth in a rocking chair. She was just staring out toward the road. We waved, but she didn't wave back. The next time my mom and the mom next door spoke, my mom asked her who she'd had visiting. She said nobody was. My mom then asked her who the old woman in the rocking chair was the other day. Very casually, my mom claims the woman said, Oh, that was just the old woman who lived here before us. She died. That was her rocking chair. Apparently, it came with the house, and even though she still rocks in it, they kept it. Apparently, they were okay with just living with the ghost. So, it's apparent that some people are totally fine living in haunted houses, but personally, I'm not. My mother went to Eastern Washington University and stayed in one of the houses the locals rented out to college students. I can't give the exact age of the house, but it was old enough to have a built-in button on the floor that would call up the servants to the attic, so the house was relatively old. During her studies there, she had three different roommates. My uncle was the first, who then was replaced by my mother's best friend, who was then replaced by my father. All three of them can confirm strange happenings in this house and being woken up in the middle of the night with people whispering. The worst of it was in my mother's room in the attic. My mother hated that house, but she didn't have anywhere else to live and the dorms were expensive, so she sucked it up and lived there until she graduated. She hated sleeping alone. The air in her room constantly felt thick and heavy. Her closet was constantly freezing cold, and at night, she would hear multiple people whispering incoherent words all at once. 
While living there, my mother had a cat named Puss, like Puss in Boots, who would constantly hide under the bed. One time, my mother caught the cat out from under her bed, sitting, watching, and growling at one of the corners of the room. My mom went over to the cat, confused at what she was looking at, until she saw a black figure in the corner slowly start to move upwards toward the ceiling. Puss started to become more aggressive, her hissing and growling getting louder before she freaked out and shot off back under the bed, still growling at the corner until the figure was gone. My mother had never seen the cat act like this, since she was usually a very loving and happy cat, but whatever that was clearly terrified her. Sometime later, my mother was talking with a friend who was excited to be touring two famous paranormal investigators around the college in town, showing them supposedly haunted places. My mother brought up the fact that she has always had weird things happen in her house and thinks it might be haunted. Her friend got all excited and begged her to let him bring them to her house. My mother refused since she wasn't willing to stay up late for some people she doesn't even know. My mother didn't know at the time who these investigators were, since she never really kept up with paranormal stuff, believing that doing so can let evil into your life. She only knew that they were on quite a few popular talk shows at the time. It turns out that these two investigators were Ed and Lorraine Warren. Around midnight, my mother's best friend comes to her and tells her that there are people at the door who want to speak to her. Confused, my mother put on a robe and went to the front door. There she saw her tour guide friend with 12 other students behind Ed and Lorraine Warren. Lorraine asked my mother if they could come in as their guide had told them that it was possible her house was haunted. My mother agreed and let them all in. Lorraine asked my mother where in the house the haunting was more active and my mother told her that it was in the bedroom, that she would take Ed and Lorraine there but everyone else had to wait. They agreed, and my mother took Ed and Lorraine to her room. When my mother entered the room, she sat on her bed and asked if they could feel it, how heavy the air was. Ed and Lorraine agreed that the air was heavy. Lorraine walked around the room to the closet and asked if she could hear voices here. My mother broke down crying and said she could hear them every night and that it kept her up at night. Lorraine told her it was possible that her closet was a doorway for people who had passed on or a doorway to hell. My mother continued to cry before Lorraine came over to her and told her that the reason these things are happening is because of her mom's family, that the women have some connection with those beyond, and that it's possible that they are psychics, which makes the dead more attracted to her. My mother then told Lorraine about the black figure, which Lorraine told her wasn't from this house, but was connected to her family, mainly on her dad's side and that it was most likely something that went after her grandfather, her father, and now her. The figure wasn't a ghost or a demon, but just something that was pure evil and wanted her. Fearful, my mother asked them if they could bless her room, which they did, and after further investigation of the house, Ed and Lorraine told her that her house was the first place that actually showed activity and signs of a haunting in the whole area. After they finished blessing the house, Ed and Lorraine left. Time passed and my mom's best friend moved out and my dad moved in. The activity in the house still continued even after the blessing. At first, my father was skeptical of the house being haunted until one night while sleeping in my mom's bed, he heard the whispering. He asked my mother what she said and she told him she didn't say anything. After a few moments of silence between them, she asked if he could hear them. Confused, my father asked what she was talking about. She said, the whispering. He then agreed that he heard the whispering and asked where it was coming from. She said that it was coming from the closet and that it happens every night. Sometime after, my father got curious about whether or not that servant's bell still worked. Originally, no one had ever been up to the attic. Both of my parents made their way up to the attic, but never reached the top. Since on their way there, both of my parents felt like they couldn't breathe as the temperature dropped into the freezing ranges. My mother started to panic and she felt like she was being choked. She quickly told my father to turn back around because it felt as though they weren't wanted up there. 
not wanting to upset my mother even more, my father agreed and turned back around, never to go up there again. Once my mother graduated from college, they moved out of the house, and strange events continued to happen no matter where they moved. Around the time that I was born, my parents lived in a rather small house with my two older brothers. Constantly, our cats would freak out, growling and hissing at the corners of the house. Not only that, but my mother would constantly see this black figure around the house. Later, my family had our new house constructed and we moved out of our old one. These strange events followed us and got worse. One day when I was around five, I was walking outside my room to walk downstairs. The moment I walked to the balcony, I felt somebody grab my arm extremely roughly. I turned around and all I see is this black figure holding my arm. I scream for my mother. My mother comes running up the stairs and she sees the figure. She grabs my arm and tries to pull me away, but the figure will not let me go. She pulled as hard as she could and ripped me away from it. As she does this, the figure disappears and a giant hand mark is left on my arm. My mother runs downstairs and screams at my father to get my brothers and that they were leaving the house until it was blessed. We later had a priest come to our house and bless it. Afterward, the activity stopped, but growing up, my second older brother and I would constantly have nightmares of this figure in our dreams, doing awful things to us. But in our dreams, it had bright red eyes and would chase us. Nothing else has happened since then, and I still live in the house. But every once in a while, I get this sudden fear from the staircase. I never go downstairs at night without the lights on, out of fear that this thing is possibly still here. I had spoken to my mother about the dreams and stuff that happened to her, but she tries to avoid talking about it since she believes the more we talk about it, the more it will come back. She has told me, though, that she spoke with my grandfather about this figure. He refused to talk much about it, since the first time she brought it up, he went pale as a ghost. He said that figure used to torment him as a child, and his dad would tell him about the figure and how it would come for him as it did with my grandfather. My mother didn't realize that it was Ed and Lorraine Warren until we were watching a documentary about them. She points to them and says, those are the ones that came to my house. I was speechless and she was confused. I told her that they were the Ed and Lorraine Warren, the most famous paranormal investigators ever pretty much, that they were the ones who started publicly doing paranormal investigations and that there are famous horror movies that involve them. My mother freaks out and tells my father about it, and while my father was shocked, he didn't think much of it. I'm sorry if this story is a little all over the place, but it's the best attempt I have to explain my mother's story, and my experience, since my mother doesn't like to talk about it much out of fear. This was told to me by my mom and dad when I grew up. I am Native American and raised both spiritual and Catholic. My father's side of the family is spiritual and believes in ghosts and respecting them. I was raised like that. When I was a few weeks old, my parents and auntie were walking to the store with me. My dad was carrying me with my mom on one side of him and my aunt on the other. The store was about two blocks away from my grandma's house on a dirt road. But it was on the reservation, and she lived in an area with a lot of houses on both sides of the street. When they reached the halfway point, my mom noticed a light on in a vehicle. She thought that someone left the dome light on and told my dad. While looking at the van, I began to cry. My mom said that it wasn't my normal cry, so she started checking to see if I was okay. The closer they walked toward the van, the brighter the light got. My auntie told my dad to cover me up and not let any part of me show while she started praying in their language. My mom said at this point I was screaming and she was terrified. Then I stopped and at the same time the light went out. 
My dad later explained that when they got closer, the light was getting brighter and brighter, like a spotlight. But the light didn't have a source because the van was in an accident the week prior and the battery was gone, along with most of the engine. A man who was driving passed on. It's relevant because my dad was looking at the van and he swore he saw an outline of a person in the driver's seat and thought somebody was playing a prank. My auntie's version was the same, but after she was praying, she kept looking at the van and she said she saw a small ball of light shoot out of the driver's door and toward the house. She didn't tell my parents because my mom was freaking out. My mom only said that everything was quiet when the light was getting brighter. She didn't hear dogs barking, and they always bark on the res. No birds were cawing, and there was no other noise other than my crying. So that's that. My first paranormal experience, and I wasn't even aware of it. So, I'm a 23-year-old man, and I recently had an experience quite unlike any of my lifetime. I live in a community housing project. I would say it's half a hotel motel and half apartments. It's one building with three floors of maybe about 20 different studio bedrooms on each floor, and two other buildings with the same, except those are two bedrooms. That's neither here nor there, I'm just trying to give some perspective. I've been staying at this place for about eight months now. I haven't really had any problems at all. I wouldn't say this is a problem, not as of yet, but it is weird. Now, there was an old lady that stayed directly across from me. She must have had kind of a rough life, because she broke down pretty badly mentally over time. Every night since I first moved here, I would hear her screaming and yelling and cursing literally having a whole entire conversations. Now this was weird from the start, but after a few days, I learned that she lives completely alone. I heard her literally making threats every night, sometimes crying and apologizing to someone. Now after a while, I actually ended up getting used to this behavior. Sometimes I would actually see her in the hall. No one ever talked to her. She would point at everybody and would say the most vicious, evil things to literally everyone. Our first encounter, I was met with the same treatment. I fake smiled it off and asked how she was doing. Ever since the death of my grandmother in 2014, I for some reason have an extreme soft spot and instant love for old ladies. Not in a weird way, just in like a how are you, let me help you with your bags ma'am kind of way. I approached this lady in a similar fashion, and she seemed like she didn't know what to do with that and didn't know how to take it, but she never met me with the same aggression after that. Now, I have been here for eight months, like I said. Fast forward to just several weeks ago. By this time, this lady and I have crossed paths maybe nine to ten times. Briefly, but a few times. We never really had a conversation at all but I would always make sure that I spoke to her and acknowledged her. She didn't really show emotion, but a little gratitude. Now every day, all day, she would still continue this manic-like screaming in her room. She very literally was sounding like an older, very angry, middle-aged man. Now, as I said, I was directly across from her, but we're also right dead at the end of our long, long hallway. And, to make things even better, I have a 10-hour shift job that I work 4-5 to five days a week. I'm working a 5pm to 4am shift. So just imagine, a long day of work. You get to your home, at the very end of the hall, almost isolated with this lady. At 4am we know it's very early, but very late also. It's still dark outside when I pull up to my apartment. It would be 4.30 in the morning, and this woman is still up, barking, growling, shouting, evil, haunting, and spooky stuff, sounding like a man. I swear this is absolutely not an exaggeration. 
Now on to the actually scary part. Right now it's 4.14 in the morning as I type this. I actually took a day off today, and I may take another just to wrap my head around what has happened in the last few days. Sunday morning, at around 6 o'clock in the morning, this woman was found dead in her room, right across from me. She wasn't killed, nobody ever came to see her or anything. She had no relationships as far as any resident here ever knew. A maintenance man would check on her at least once a day because, like me, he felt very bad for the old woman. When he checked on her this day, he had seen that she had passed and obviously reported it. She was found at 6 a.m. and they had her wrapped up and gone by 9 a.m. From what I was told, they say it was natural causes or side. They don't know which. Now, I spent that weekend at my girlfriend's place, so I wasn't present when whatever happened happened. I also had no idea that she had died. But when I returned to my apartment Sunday at 11.30 in the afternoon to noon, I walked the halls and for the first time in eight months heard no screaming. Now keep in mind, I have no knowledge of what has happened as I'm walking to my door. I see absolutely no one in sight. I turn and stick my key in and I hear a familiar voice. It's the old lady, but she looks much different. She looks cleaner and happy. Her hair wasn't all over the place from constantly running into walls, and she actually spoke clearly. She saw me and said, Hey, I was shocked at just that simple three-letter basic greeting from this woman. Honestly, with the events that transpired, I can't remember our exact conversation verbatim, but it was literally the happiest and best I'd ever seen her. It took me a few seconds to realize it was even her. At this point, my encounter with her was when it was approaching noon. Remember, she died at 6 a.m. But anyway, we had a brief conversation and I said, I'll see you later, ma'am. I'm a little tired, but you look beautiful today. She said, I'll see you again, young man. She said this and walked back into her apartment. It was something about her. She had a certain glow to her a certain force and energy that I had never felt before from her. But anyway, now at this time I think nothing about it and I go into my house and shut the door to use the restroom. A lady from the rental office who I'm close with and look up to as a godmother came and knocked on my door. Her name is Miss Tate. I opened and she asked me how I was doing. I said, I'm fine, chillin', you know, the usual. She had a very horrified look on her face and sad look. She said, have you heard about the incident? I said, no, what's going on? She says, the woman across the hall from you, she took her own life this morning. Now I look at her and say nothing for legitimately 15 seconds. I ask, are you talking about the screaming lady across the hall? She says, yes. I ask, are you sure it was her? She gives me a really confused look before quickly saying, I saw that lady with my own eyes, sweetie. I say, I saw her with my own eyes too, just 15 to 20 minutes ago. Miss Tate, I don't know if this was supposed to be a joke or whatever, but you need to give it up. She looked dumbfounded, and we nearly had a really bad argument. I said, let's go to her room right now. She repeatedly says, I'm not going, you can go all you want. She said that she was never going in that room again. Miss Tate finally cooled down and showed me all the proof and paperwork, and now I'm literally at a loss for words. I never even got to know that woman's name. Miss Tate told me that she suffered from extreme schizophrenia and dementia. Also, she had a very sad last half of her life. I'm still not entirely sure what happened to me. Can somebody please explain this to me? I want to think that there's some natural explanation to this. But if not, I guess I saw a ghost. This story is a few years old now, but it's interesting nonetheless. This involves what I believe to have been a poltergeist. 
I was already very interested in spirits and had attempted to communicate with them various times. This is the first and only time that the communication was successful. To protect mine and others' identities, the names in this story are fake. Every other detail, however, is completely true. When I had just turned 19 years old, I moved out of my grandparents' house for the first time with my best friend Alex and my ex-boyfriend Tim. Alex's son would be at the house every other week because Alex was separated from his mother. Let's call the kid Rex. Rex was a very cool kid. He was only three years old, but was still able to beat me at Mario Kart Double Dash, which I grew up on. Because he was so smart, Alex didn't question it when Rex would talk to himself. Because apparently, a lot of smart kids do this. One day, being the self-proclaimed ghost hunter that I am, I asked who he was talking to. Rex looks back in the direction he was originally talking, and then back to me after about five seconds. Nobody, he said, and went back to talking quietly and playing. Tim and I exchanged freaked out looks, but Alex exclaimed, see, he's not talking to anybody. I didn't buy it, despite him still being a close friend. A few weeks go by and I find myself babysitting Rex alone at the house. He was playing outside on our carport that we turned into a porch. I told him it was time to go inside so that I could make him lunch. He sat at the dining room table and I sat in the living room next to the door to the carport. I'm scrolling through Facebook when all of a sudden I hear one of Rex's toys start singing. I peep out the blinds on the window of the door and I couldn't see anything that would make it go off. I figured it was a squirrel and sat back down. Not a minute later, it started singing again. I opened my camera app on my phone and began recording. It didn't stop until Rex came into the living room to proclaim that he was done with his sandwich and was ready to go back outside and play. I compromised with him into watching something on Netflix instead without giving away any details. I ended up brushing it off, thinking maybe somehow the button was stuck. Another week or so goes by. I'm home alone, as I had a day off from my job at Pizza Hut, but the guys were at work. I was doing the dishes in the kitchen. Our kitchen was pretty nice. A nice fridge on the opposite side of the kitchen than the sink had liquor bottles on top of it, sat toward the back of the fridge. As I was listening to music and finishing up, a bottle flew off the fridge and smashed into the opposite wall. I waited in Tim and I's bedroom until Alex got home and explained what happened. He said it was probably sitting up there for so long that it found its way to the edge. I became quite scared of whatever was going on at this point. But my ex and best friend were signed on to the lease and anything beat living with my grandparents again, even though I ultimately moved back home. Yet another week goes by and I'm out delivering pizzas. I rode by the house fairly often on my routes, because we lived next door to the strip my store was in. I glanced over on this particular day and saw a raggedy lady standing outside our carport door. She was wearing tattered clothing and her hair was curly and unbrushed. She was just standing there, staring at the door. I immediately called Alex, maybe three seconds after seeing her. He answered immediately. I told him to go look out the door at the carport, and he did without question. He said, I don't see anything, and I explained to him what I saw. He didn't know what to think of it. At this point, I was seriously concerned. I began stating we needed to protect the house and wore a blessed necklace a friend of mine from college had made for me. The last experience I had in this house isn't the reason I moved out, but happened shortly before I did. I went to sleep early one night, being high off my ass, 
I normally wouldn't go to sleep without Tim because of the events that had been happening. I left the door cracked open and a small standard nightlight on to give me peace of mind. About three minutes after falling asleep, my eyes dart open. I realized I had fallen asleep on my back, which often leads to minor sleep paralysis for me. I had taught myself a trick, wiggling my toes to get out of it. But no matter how much I wiggled my toes this time, I couldn't get out of it. I then heard the door creak open. I was relieved because I thought it was Tim. But when you're paralyzed in your sleep, it's never what you want it to be. The raggedy lady I had seen outside of my carport door glided to the corner of my bed. I couldn't see any details of her face. It was like someone had shaded it out with a pencil. She was wearing the same tattered striped shirt, and what I could now see was a long black skirt. I want to speak to the boy, she said. I'm not sure if I actually said anything to tell her okay, as I was mortified. But sure enough, Rex, who was in the room over, glided into the room next to her, and I woke up. I immediately bolted out of bed and opened Rex's bedroom door. He was muttering in his sleep. I told Alex and Tim what happened immediately, but neither of them seemed concerned. None of us live in that house anymore, and Alex has told me that Rex no longer talks to himself. Go figure. I never saw the raggedy lady again, and I hope I never do. In 2013, my wife and I divorced and we both moved into separate homes. The divorce went well and we are still good friends to this day, partly because we have a daughter together. We agreed to split custody over our daughter and I rented an old house in a historic district in the city where we live. It was a very pretty home, built in 1935 but kept up very well. I would have my daughter two weeks at a time and she had a bedroom in the back of the house. She was three years old at the time, and I kept noticing her talking to her friend. One day I found her in a little closet, talking to someone, and I remember her saying that she was talking to another little girl named Betty. I have no idea where she heard the name Betty, as she was only three years old, but I just chalked it all up to a child's vivid imagination. Keep in mind, I'm a single dad to a little girl. I really have no idea what I'm doing, when it comes to dressing, hair, or little girl stuff in general. Her mother is good at that stuff, but not me. I put my daughter to bed one night after her bath. I remember brushing her hair that night, but that was all I did. The very next morning, her mom came to pick her up from my house, and my daughter was just waking up. Her mom went back to her bedroom to find my daughter's hair was fixed into two perfect French braids. Her mom was really proud of me at first, and said that I had done her hair so cute, but I told her that I didn't and couldn't do that. I can't even regular braid her hair, much less do a perfect French braid. We asked our daughter how she'd gotten her hair fixed, and she told us that Betty had done it during the night. I broke the contract on that rental agreement and moved out within the next month. I want to tell you about the times that I was mimicked, or at least the times that I encountered a mimic. The first one was actually a mimic of my sister. My other three siblings were at home and wanted to get takeout, so they called for my sister, who was not in the house at the time. She was outside with me. Now, I don't know if this is fake or not, but someone answered, or something did and they said it sounded exactly like her. When the food came, they called for her again to get her stuff, but this time no one answered. So my brother took the pizza to her. 
He went inside the room just to find no one there. A dark, empty room. When they told me this, I could confirm that she was with me, but I didn't know whether to believe that something actually mimicked her or not. I thought they were just pulling our leg. The second time was a mimic of me, and I was scared out of my wits. My mother wanted to go out to the 7-Eleven store, and I was like, nope, not gonna happen, because it was really late at night. She ended up leaving anyway, and I was pretty upset, sulking in a corner. I was really scared because I had been watching too much Criminal Minds, and that shit makes you paranoid. So after her little run, she stood at the bus stop waiting for the bus. When she heard me behind her, she legit heard Mama in my voice. I was even more terrified when she told me, because again, it was my voice and I was clearly not behind her. I still didn't believe it though. But a lot of things have happened in my household, like some scary shit, and I guess this just adds to it. I still have a hard time believing it, but I don't know why my mother of all people would lie. Would you believe it? Or would you think it was nonsense? I have absolutely no memory of this experience. I was a little over two years old and just starting to walk on my own when this event took place. My mom only told me this story about three years ago when I was 32 and about to get married. My mother was raised in a very tiny fundamentalist Christian community and had no belief in the paranormal. She believed that our souls sleep until judgment day or something like that. Ergo, there are no ghosts or spirits around to haunt houses. Even over 30 years later, she still sounded terrified as she told me this. This woman who always talks way too loud was literally whispering by the end of it and was white as a sheet. I believed her completely and I still do. My mom never talks about stuff like this. I'm just glad that I can't remember it also. In 1988, my parents had their second child. This was my brother, whom I'll call Victor. We were very crowded in our rented flat with two babies. My parents decided to move to a rambling old two-story farmhouse on a seven-acre plot in southern Ohio for more room for the family. It was way out in the sticks and took almost an hour to get to town from there. My mom said that the very first time I saw the house, I freaked out. I was crying and saying things like, don't like mean house, mean the house, ugly house, don't like, scary house mama, don't like. My mom said this behavior was very out of character for me, but I stopped complaining about the house after a few weeks, so she just chalked it up to the stress of the move. Now this house was ramshackle and in the middle of nowhere. The kitchen was to the far rear of the house. And, until recently before we moved in, still had a working ancient wood-burning cooking stove against the back wall. This had caught the back wall on fire a couple of months before we moved in, and had caused a lot of damage. A lot of that damage wasn't fixed. So my young, broke parents got a very cheap rental agreement. Gotta love the 80s. On the second floor, directly above the kitchen, was a locked room. The landlord claimed that it had heavy fire damage, but her son, who had done the repairs, claimed the only fire damage left was in the kitchen since it had been the worst and was beyond his skill level to fix. Either way, the landlord was absolutely adamant that the room was off limits, and my parents always respected that. I would have looked, 100%. I know all this because I heard stories about the crappy farmhouse with the creepy door my whole life and there were pictures of us in and around the farmhouse. The locked door was right next to the upstairs landing, so there was no avoiding it. Both my parents have told me that it gave them the creeps. A few months after we moved in, my mother and I were in the yard with our pit Doberman mix, Boss. She was hanging laundry and I was rolling around with Boss. 
She said that just as she noticed that everything was way too silent, Ba started going ape from surprisingly far away. About 500 yards from the house on the left, there was a small duck pond. Boss was in between the two, running toward my mom, then turning and running back toward the pond, then back to my mom, barking frantically the whole time. My mom saw something thrashing around in the middle of the pond. She took off toward the water at full speed. Boss beat her there and dragged me out of the water himself. Thanks, pupper. Although my mom was confused how I got so far so fast and how I had gotten into the center of the pond since it was over my head and I couldn't swim, she figured she underestimated me and brought in the baby gates and the play pens. I was to be contained from now on. A few weeks later, she was cooking downstairs. Boss was outside, Victor was asleep in his crib, and I was in my playpen in my room upstairs. I also had a gate on my door and one at the top of the stairs. The stairs ran up from the side of the kitchen, so my mom said she could listen for us crying or fussing while she cooked. My mom said no longer than 15 minutes after the last time she looked in on us kids, Boss started going crazy again in the yard. She runs up to check on us, Victor is still sleeping. Every baby gate is still shut and locked, but I am not in my room. A frenzied search reveals that I'm not in the house at all. A sudden image of Boss saving me from drowning causes my mom to rush outside to see what he's trying to tell her this time. She said he was running circles in the yard, barking uncontrollably. When she got outside, he took off toward the right, away from the pond. He would run ahead, turn around and bark at my mother, wait for her to catch up a little and then race off again. He ended up leading her almost a mile and a half out onto the dirt road that separated our property from our neighbors. And then he led her to a thick stand of trees on our neighbor's side of the rocky drive. She said what hit her first was the foul stench of advanced decay. She plowed into the trees with her heart in her throat and her stomach full of ice. She said she noticed many piles of corrugated tin, tarps, tires, and other debris. The miasma was emanating most strongly from these junkyard cairns. Peeking under a sheet of tin, she discovered the extremely decomposed corpse of a butchered cow. As she headed deeper into the thicket, where the tree cover was denser, she said less care was taken to cover the remains. Grizzly pieces of bones and rotted chunks of bovine littered the area. Apparently, our neighbor, in an effort to cheat his taxes, had been illegally slaughtering cattle and hiding the remains in at least one of the few thick stands of trees around. She found me in the dead center of this thicket, just standing there, looking around like I was confused, surrounded by carnage. She said I didn't seem scared or anything, I was just standing. She rushed over to me and, after ascertaining that I wasn't injured, began to question me on why I was there and how I'd gotten there. Keep in mind that although my mother said I started speaking very young, I still didn't have much of a vocabulary. She said that I told her, with that serious look only small children can give, that the children had brought me here. Shatting her pants at the thought that anyone, even children, could walk right past her through the kitchen, get me from upstairs and walk right past her on the way down the stairs and out with me, she demanded to know what children and where the hell they are now. I looked her dead serious in the eye and told her, the ones that live with us in the room at the top of the stairs, I don't see them anymore. After a moment of stunned silence, she started asking all kinds of questions about these children. However, she told me that I refused to say anything else. She said as long as she questioned me about what happened, I would just stand there staring at her with that serious expression and my mouth closed. She said the same pattern held true every other time she brought it up to me. So she was always left wondering and immediately began hounding my dad about moving closer to town. While the incident with me getting to the pond was highly unlikely, it was at least remotely possible. My mother is adamant that me being in the hidden slaughter yard that day was a flat impossibility. She says there's no way that I could have even known it was out there 
much less have had the ability to open and relock the baby gates, get downstairs past her and two miles down the road, all in under 15 minutes. I was only two and as slow and clumsy as most toddlers are. As I said, it's 30 years later and she's still shaken by it. I have no idea what happened that day. I have thought about hypnosis, but haven't yet decided that I really want to remember. Maybe it's better to let it be a mystery, because whatever those things were, I highly doubt that they were children. Have you ever heard of Great Wolf Lodge? The huge indoor water park packed with arcades, restaurants, and basically everything you could imagine? Well, I've been there twice, and the first time I had an experience that I wouldn't wish on anyone. I was there with my brother, my aunt and uncle, and my cousin. We got a room that came with the kid cabin. All that was in the kid cabin was a bunk bed, a small TV, a nightstand, and some cool paintings on the wall. The first night was fine. I slept on the top bunk and Natalia, my cousin, slept on the bottom. The next day, my cousin begged to sleep on the bottom bunk again, so me, wanting the top bunk anyway, allowed it. I stayed up really late that night. I mean, not really, it was like 10.30, but being seven, I thought it was so cool. All I had for light was a small 3DS light. As I started to fall asleep and put down the game, I heard my cousin laughing. Well, more of a giggle. What's so funny? I asked, laughing a little myself. Stop, you're scaring me, she replied, her laughter fading a bit. Well, what? I responded, confused and a bit scared. How are you making that face? All of her laughter had poured out of that innocent seven-year-old's voice by now. I was rushing to turn on my 3DS for the light. I asked, what do you mean? I'm up here. She paused. Who is that? She said, realizing that whoever she was talking to wasn't me at all. She started to cry and call for me. The DS was still loading and by the time it turned on, she said that it was gone. The next day, I asked more about it. She said that there was a girl with black hair bobbing up and down and smiling really big. To this day, it still scares me. In the town of Baldenboro, just eight miles southwest of Elizabethtown, where I stay, it was said that a demon cat from hell used to stalk the woods, killing livestock and making the locals scared. And then, suddenly, it disappeared. That's what they say anyway. But we know that it didn't. To this day, there have been reports of something that looks like an abnormally large mountain lion with blood-red eyes and fur as black as night. Its cries have been compared to that of a woman being torn apart and screaming for her life. Luckily, it's only ever gotten a taste for goats and cows, or so we think anyway. I will tell you, there have been a few people that have gone missing. Some have been found, and to hear some of the police tell the stories, the bodies were torn to shreds. It's not just located in Baldenboro, like most think. It goes from Bladen Lake State Forest to the Green Swamp, which covers three counties and over 1,200 square miles. A friend of mine was hunting one day down in the Green's Swamp when it started getting dark. If you hunt in this area, you know that you've got to be out of the woods by dark, by law. So he climbed down from his tree stand and began the long walk through the swamp and underbrush to where he had parked his truck. Now, my friend is a cornbread-fed southern boy and has the size to prove it. 
Standing at six foot six with a weight of 260 pounds, he is pure farm muscle and he's not small by any standard. So he's learned not to be afraid of anything. He said that what happened next made him never want to go hunting in that swamp again. Making his way through the brush, he said he began hearing something walking through the woods toward him. He stopped to listen for it and said that it sounded like a large black bear, so he got his gun ready just in case. When he stopped, it stopped. When he walked, it walked. He said it made him nervous because whatever it was knew he was there and wasn't running off. He said that he started making noise and even shot his gun into the air as a warning. It didn't leave. Instead, it let out a growl, he said, that you could feel as much as hear. All the way through the woods, it just stayed behind him and out of sight, but he knew that he was being stalked. When he came out of the woods onto the dirt road, he said his truck was about 50 yards down from him. He decided that there was a pretty good chance that whatever was following him was going to keep following or make a move on him there, so he took off running. It took off running too. He said that it sounded like a bulldozer was crashing through the woods, and when it broke from the woods, it sounded like a horse running through loose dirt. He could hear the stomps of its feet and the growling of its breath. He didn't have to look back to know that it was coming and catching up to him. He shot behind him, hoping that it would scare it enough to stop for a moment and give him a chance to make it to the truck. When he did, he said he must have hit it because it screamed. For a moment, he thought it was a person. That's when he finally turned around. He said this thing was jet black, as big as a 600 pound black bear, a tail as long as its body and eyes that were glowing red. He hit it and it was just standing there, looking at him, as if to say, now you've done it. He bolted to the truck and jumped in. Just as he shut the door, he looked and it was right there. He said the thing was so close that its breath was fogging the window. By now he said he was shaking so badly and it was everything he could do to get the key in the ignition and start the motor. He drives a Ford F-350 four-wheel drive that was raised up, so there's a good two feet of clearance under the truck. He said this thing was on all four feet and looking eye to eye with him in his truck. The engine started and he took off like a bat out of hell. He said it chased him as hard as it could until he picked up speed and stopped and watched him drive off after that. The next day, he and his dad went back with guns and looked around for tracks, blood, or even a dead body. He said there was no blood, even though he knows it was shot, and there were paw prints as big as his hands on the ground everywhere. Then they found a tree that nine feet up had claw marks one inch deep in the wood, spaced about four inches apart from each other. They didn't venture into the woods, nor did they go too far from the truck. Both of them said they felt as though they were being watched and didn't want to stick around to find out what it was. They got back into the truck and that's when they heard it, a scream from the woods off in the distance. He said it was that same scream, like a woman screaming bloody murder. It was there, letting them know that it was there and that it was waiting. There are many a dark secrets in them woods, as my grandpa would say. Charlie Daniels even wrote about these woods in one of his songs. If you ever get adventurous and want to try your luck, come on down to Green's Swamp, and when the sun goes down, get real quiet. You might hear that scream. I hope when you do, it's off in the distance and not close by. Cause if it is, well, it might just be the last sound you hear. So this happened when I was 18. I lived with my parents in a sleepy suburb outside of DC. It's a big three-story house with a left side deck and the basement outside door is beneath the deck. Going underneath the deck is a granite rock staircase out to our backyard 
which is a steep 30 degree slope down a peppy little creek. Now that that's out of the way, it's the summer of my senior year. My parents are out of town for a week. I leave the Marine Corps in a few months, so naturally I throw a rager. The party was pretty rad. A metal band showed up at some point. Many a gallon of swill was ingested, and it went on late into the night. At around three, there were a few of us left, just hanging out and shooting the shit. Eventually, everyone falls asleep, except for me and my two friends, Heather and Amber. So we go out on the deck, which overlooks the hill and my neighbor's yard, separated from ours by a wooden fence roughly three feet high. They have a rock garden that's tiered with about two feet drop downs for about 20 total feet, with a nice pagoda in the middle. They also have a weeping angel style three foot tall statue overlooking the hill a few feet away from the fence. Anyway, we're out there getting lung cancer, smoking, and we keep hearing these footsteps coming up the rock path. It's pitch black, so we can't see who's coming up, and I didn't want to turn on the floodlights because I'm worried I'll wake the neighbors. I whisper down, drive safe, thinking it's someone leaving the party. The footsteps abruptly stop, and I jokingly call out, good night to you too. Around a minute or so passes and we start getting weirded out, wondering what the fuck that person is doing there, just standing. Amber yells out, are you okay? No response. So I go inside and grab a flashlight quickly and shine in below the deck to see what the matter is. There's nobody there. I ask Heather and Amber if they heard them walk off and they assured me that they hadn't. This is when Heather notices the statue. I said it was pointed down the hill. Well, it's now turned noticeably toward us. Not facing us, but it's clearly been moved. We get real quiet, light up another cigarette, and start talking about how strange all of this is. Now, I spent eight years in the Corps, and I've seen plenty of funny, creepy, and weird shit since then. But I've never seen anything like I did that night. As we're looking at the statue, it fucking gets turned facing us even more. We all see it, and we start freaking out. Not quietly, I say, what the? And right as I do, we hear loud footsteps on the rock stairs again. Heavy, fast, moving steps. I quickly shine my light down there. For the second time, there's nothing. I shine it over to the statue, and I swear it's been moved another 90 degrees. We then hear squishing, crunching footsteps coming from by the statue. We had a little garden area, maybe eight feet or so, in between the stairs and the neighbor's fence. That's where the footstep sounds are coming from. At this point, we're all scared, but being a guy, and Heather and Amber both being attractive, I exclaim that I'm going to go investigate, to try to calm them down. They say they'll follow right behind me, not wanting to be alone. So we go out the front door and slowly creep our way down the steps. Before we round the corner of the house, we hear the footsteps again, beating feet away from us down the hill. Mind you, there's nowhere to go down there, just fifty or so acres of woods and the creek our house being on the ass end of the cul-de-sac. We get to the spot where we heard the crunching and I shine my light down the hill. Nothing but the trees and their shadows. I shine my light to the fence and the statue is now facing us completely. I start to walk over to the fence, shining my light down so I don't trip. And Heather says, wait, look. I look down and see several massive boot prints. Think shack-sized shoes. They go toward the statue and stop. One of the prints was made around the fucking fence post, like something had stepped through it. Listen, my balls are only so big, so I say run, and we take off back inside and rush upstairs and into my bed, thoroughly freaked out. We stayed there for about 30 minutes, 
trying to think of how any of that was possible. Nothing came to mind then, and nothing does now. After about another ten minutes or so, I realize that I didn't lock the door. So I go back downstairs into the front door. As I lock it and turn around, I hear a fairly loud bang on the deck, like someone or something hit one of the support columns. I promptly decide fuck the neighbors and turn on all of the floodlights and run back upstairs. We stayed up until the sun began peeking through the trees, talking about what the fuck just happened. It was seriously terrifying. That's the end of that night. The statue was back to its normal place when we went to look in the morning sun, and the footprints were gone. I never had anything else happen in that house. My parents still live there and have never mentioned anything. But to this day, it remains one of the creepiest paranormal events I've ever witnessed. When I was three, my grandmother on my mom's side died of a heart attack. While at the funeral, the adults were outside talking and smoking cigarettes. My older brother, another family member that was close to our ages, and I were told to stay inside. They said that it was to keep us out of conversations we didn't need to hear, but who knows. Well, the other family member convinced my brother that locking me in the viewing room was a good idea. It's those rooms with red lights over the coffin. Once they locked me in, the other family member called through the door. He said the grandma needed to take me with her because I was her favorite. I screamed and cried as loud as my little self could, and some adults took me outside to my parents. I was told that they were just playing and that even though grandma loved me, she was never going to take me away. Later that year, we moved two states away. One night in the new house about four years after, I woke up in the middle of the night, which according to my mother was highly unusual. I heard a song that only my grandma ever sang to me. I sat up looking around, and I see the lid on my old toy box opening by itself. Slowly it creaked open. Once it was fully open, I saw what looked like my grandma slowly standing from inside the box. She turned slowly and really creepily to look at me. I was frozen in place. I couldn't cry or scream or even move. She started walking toward me. She stopped close to the bed and said, I came to get you. You were always my favorite and I want you with me now. Somehow I found my voice and screamed. My mom came running in and just before she got to my room, this grandma said, I'll come back for you again, and vanished. My mother came in asking who I was talking to. I told her everything, and mom let me sleep in the living room for a few nights while she got rid of my toy box. The toy box was the last thing that my grandma had ever given me. My mom told me that grandma would never scare me, and that it was the boogeyman. Later in life, I tried to ask her what she thought it was, but she told me it was over and done with and to stop talking about it. To this day, she won't talk about it or answer any of my questions. And this is by far the scariest thing that I've experienced. Where my boyfriend used to live, at his mom's, he's moved out now. It was like a new build complex. Lots of new houses and roads, like its own little village. Built around a mental asylum. They knocked the majority of it down, but what remained was the administrative building, church, and a large garden. We'd walk the dogs in the garden at night, and I always got feelings in there. Kind of in my shoulders like something was behind me, or watching me. It never felt malicious, but it creeped me out all the same. Being the adventurous people we are, we decided to explore the administrative building. 
So we gathered a few friends and headed off. This was during the day, as it was guarded at night. Getting inside involved lots of climbing through windows and up scaffolding. Once in, we split off and explored, but it was in such a state of ruin we didn't get too far. I found some stairs down to another floor and stood there for a while. I heard footsteps up the stairs and did a runner. I told the guys and they were on the other side of the building, so it definitely wasn't them. We kept hearing doors slamming, but it was a calm and sunny day. Thoroughly creeped out, we left and just explored the grounds and some of the other smaller buildings. When we got home, I was absolutely exhausted, like really drained, but I didn't think much of it. The next night I was back at home and settling down to sleep, but I couldn't get comfortable. I could feel something watching me from the end of my bed. I tossed and turned, trying to ignore it, but I could feel it, staring. I got really upset and started crying, it was so intense. I then got a thought that passed through my mind. You came to stare at me, so I'm staring at you. I bolted into my parents' room next door and told them. They calmed me down, and when I went back to bed, it was gone. Another time, we were in the garden late at night with a friend, and as usual, I could feel something there. My boyfriend and his friend were facing toward me, and I was facing them. At the other end of the garden, I saw what looked like arms and the tops of legs, walking behind a sort of archway in the garden. It was almost see-through white, and walked for about five seconds before I told the guys. Of course, it wasn't there when they turned around. The garden has got high walls all around it, so it definitely wasn't a car, and there was no one else there. That place is definitely haunted. I did some research, and the residents at the unit used to visit the garden and spend a lot of time there. They weren't treated well, and they still used all the old-fashioned treatments for mental health and learning disabilities. We haven't been back since, as my boyfriend doesn't live with his mom anymore, like I mentioned. I have always experienced the paranormal, and I'm definitely open to sensing spirits. Honestly, being followed, though, was the scariest thing I've ever been through. So, in 2019, my family are all driving back from Narrabeen when we drove in Wakers Parkway. There is a legend of this road where a lady all in white is on the side of the road, and if you're not careful, she can appear in your car. So, like I said, we're driving back and it's about 9pm. We were in the thick brush area. My mother, brother, sister, and I were asleep. My father was the only one awake and was all alone, as he puts it. He said that he was driving when he saw this lady, all in white, standing on the side of the road. He freaked out, but continued to drive. However, he said he saw the same lady two minutes later on the same side of the road. My father told us he was so freaked out that he tried to drive faster. Two minutes later, the same lady again. After we got home, he told us what had happened. Personally, I couldn't sleep for a night or so. As a kid, I grew up in the country, and I was pretty much surrounded by the woods. I had some paranormal experiences that I can't explain in those woods, and the house. I was 15, I decided to go hiking in the woods on a bright summer day. It was hot out, but being in the woods I found plenty of shade. I got lost in my own angsty teen thoughts. I don't remember what I was thinking about, but it must have been about how city kids have fun or boobs. It could have been either, it was probably boobs. I snapped out of it and realized I was in grass and brush that was literally over my head, and I couldn't tell where I was. 
I had never been in that part of the forest before, and as I looked around for anything to tell me where I was, I found nothing. For example, the stone wall that was in the eastern side of the woods, the creek that lay in a ravine to the north, or the cornfield to the west. But all I saw were trees and thick brush. When you trample through brush, you normally can see the path you took in. But oddly, there was no such path. I calmed myself and thought of what to do. I decided to head east, because the stone wall lined most of the eastern side. If I could find it, then I would be able to follow it down to a lower field and find my way back. Instead, I ended up finding the ravine that led down to the creek. But the stage, it was an old wooden structure that looked like a stage, so that's what we called it, and the field that it was in were nowhere in sight. I thought a bit that if I followed the ravine west, I would find it. That lasted ten feet when I found a really large wall of thorn bushes. South was many trees, north was the ravine with the creek blocked by thorn bushes. I'm turned around. Obviously, you've noticed that I'm not sure which is south at this point, or north, but I'm telling it from the way I was facing when I heard it. It was faint, at first, but it was clear what it was. The sound of drums. Beating steadily, as though there were a drum circle behind me in the woods. I figured it was someone out in the woods who, one, would kill me, two, would give me weed, or three, would help me out of the woods. So, being lost, I headed towards the sound. As I walked to the sound, it didn't get louder or fainter. It was steady. I just kept walking. As I walked, the beat became more distinct. Definitely a hand drum, not a drumstick. Not a big drum, but more like bongos. I followed the sound until I heard it fade, and then I heard dogs barking. It was at that point I realized where I was. It was a place that I was familiar with. I heard the drums a couple of more times when I was in the woods, but I never figured out where they came from. At one point I was walking with my cousin, and we both heard it. We swore that it came from deeper in the woods, but we weren't sure who was doing it or why. Now the fun part. I live 18 miles away from that part of the forest, but I'm at the other end of it now. The same forest travels that far. Same forest, different location. Tonight, what made me decide to tell this story was, I was out smoking a cigarette. I stood at the banks of the river that separated the forest from the yard I have, and all of a sudden in the darkness, I could hear the sound of drumming over the hill. It didn't scare me. It brought a smile to my face. Back in 2000, when I was 20, a friend of mine, a 19-year-old female, decided that she wanted to get an apartment and asked if I would be her roommate. I didn't really need a place to stay, but we decided to do it anyway. We moved to a nice apartment complex right next to and behind the house where my aunt saw her dead ex-boyfriend. The place was nice and newer, so the thought of it being haunted never crossed my mind. I didn't even experience anything until my roommate got homesick a month in and had to move back in with her folks, leaving me there alone for three months. It started with the lights coming on by themselves. I would go to bed, always turning the lights off and always closing my bedroom door. I was meticulous about the lights because that's how I was raised. I'd go to bed and at some point open my eyes and see light coming in under the door. I thought my roommate had come home. So I would get out of bed, excited to see her, only to discover I was still alone and the dining room or bathroom light would be on. Then the knocking started. Right after I'd lay down, there would be three loud knocks on my bedroom door. 
Again, thinking my roommate had come home, I would get up to greet her, only to find that I was still very much alone. A week or so before Christmas, my roommate and I went out gift shopping and went back to the apartment to wrap everything up. When we were done, we were both standing at the door, checking to see if we had everything before leaving. The apartment was completely quiet, and we heard this clearly. My acoustic guitar, which I had leaning up against the wall in my bedroom with the pick stuck between three strings, was plucked, each string in succession, then slid along the wall until hitting the floor. We just looked at each other, then walked to my bedroom to find the guitar on the floor with the pick still stuck between the strings. Those strings had been plucked, meaning the pick had been used and then replaced when done. At Christmas, during a party with her and some other friends at the apartment, the VCR turned itself off. It did that one or two other times while living there, never before or after. For Christmas, my girlfriend got me a guitar tablature book for Pink Floyd's The Wall. One night, I sat on the floor of my bedroom, learning how to play a song in it. When I was done, I put the pick in the strings and set my guitar up on the wall. But instead of closing the book as I normally did, I left it open and went to bed. Just after laying down, I heard the pages in the book flipping on their own. It was a thick book, but the song I had been learning was somewhere in the middle. I figured that the weight of the pages made it change pages on its own. But when they stopped flipping, I got curious and I got up to look. The pages stopped flipping on the song, Hey You. And when I read the title, I got chills and shut the book, pleaded with the ghost to let me sleep and went back to bed. While laying there, I realized if the pages had flipped on their own from the weight, they would have gone the other way, away from that song. After that, I started calling the ghost Pink. Anytime something happened, I would just say, oh, hey, Pink. But one night I had been out with a friend until around 2 a.m. And when I opened my door and stepped in, I could feel the ghost standing there. I said, oh, hi, Pink and I could feel the energy go through me and out of the apartment. So that's when I figured it didn't like being called that, which didn't stop me from saying it. Shortly after, my roommate came back and stayed the rest of the lease. Not much happened then. I figured if an entire house could be haunted, then surely an entire apartment building could be. I wanted to ask my neighbors if they ever experienced anything, but never did, and actually never really talked to them at all. My roommate and I were, and are, really good friends. We never dated, we never slept together. She was also really good friends with my girlfriend, and it was my girlfriend who told her to ask me to move in with her. Also, I've known since I was around 10 or so that I could feel ghosts, if you will, but usually only when standing right where they were. If I stood with them long enough, I could usually get an image in my head of what they looked like, as well as their mood. In a few instances, I've had them communicate with me like that, their words coming to me as thoughts or images, usually the latter. I usually don't tell people this because they typically don't believe me, and I would just rather not go through with the ridicule and name-calling. However, with Pink, I never figured out who or what it was. I always felt that it was male, but I didn't know. I still wonder about it from time to time. This is something that happened to a friend's brother, and a lot of people say that this town he lived in, which is called Bor in my country of Serbia, is filled with black magic, and generally not so many good things. When he started high school, he moved to Bor and stayed at some student dorms. He had a friend that had this girl that was basically stalking him. She wasn't very attractive, so he just dismissed her, and he'd often joke around about how ugly she was. My friend used to visit his brother in Bor, so he was very aware of this stalker girl. He visited him about once a month. The next time he came, though, the guy was in love with the stalker girl, 
she would piggyback him and run through the halls and engage in behavior that was pretty abnormal for the guy. My friend naturally asked the guy why he was with this girl, especially when he'd said she was so ugly. This guy picked up my friend by his throat, threatening him, saying that if he ever said anything bad about her, he'd kill him. He asked his brother what had happened to the guy, and his brother told him that this girl did black magic on him. Apparently they found some weird stuff under the guy's pillow, but he wouldn't listen to any of them. So the brother, being fed up with the things going on in the dorms, decided to rent a house out with his best friend while he was there. He told me a lot of creepy stories about that town, but this was one of the creepiest. He said that they were at a student party and were walking back home. He and his friend had to pass this park. Through the middle of the park were these stairs. They had to pass them to get back home, and they were a really long set of stairs. So after the party, maybe two to three in the morning, they're walking past those stairs, and they see a really old woman slowly walking up the stairs, holding both of the rails. They consult each other as to what they should do, if they should help her. But knowing the parts they were in and considering the time, they decided to cautiously walk past her. The brother's friend was the first one to walk past her, and as soon as he did, he just starts bolting up the stairs like his life depended on it. The brother, now reasonably scared, walked past the granny, and he said that the granny looked straight into his eyes, with hollow eyes, and he said she was crying blood. He said he ran so fast he overtook his friend and never looked back. There are a lot of tales of folklore from that town, and knowing them I'm not surprised at what the people who live there tell me. 